Hello and welcome to the official EFL podcast and another special edition of the show today. As you can see, former Leeds United, Blackpool, uh, Preston, Huddersfield, Sunderland manager. Quite a few clubs to name there. Uh, Simon Grayson joins us on the show. Simon, welcome, first of all. Thanks for joining us. No worries. Um, you obviously recently lost your job at Blackpool, but how much are you enjoying your break away from the, the game at the moment? Uh, it's only been a short space of time. Um, since I've left, I've been in India for 10 days, went out there to, to see a friend, sample the life experience of being in Mumbai, then into Goa, and as it coincided, it was the Indian Cup final out there, so I went out to watch a game. Owen Cole was actually managing Chennai, unfortunately he lost, but it was a, just a great experience to be able to get away. Last year, I had a year out of work, was the first time <coughs> in uh, 32 years that I'd not done a pre-season, so it's quite... Uh, Quite nice to have a little bit of time out like I did last year. Um, who knows what the future is going to hold in terms of going back to work, media stuff, football, coaching, managing or whatever. Um, but sometimes you've got to take a break just to find yourself and, and improve yourself and see where it takes you again. And I suppose like most people you'll have to be taking a break as well with the current situation. Um, you're hungry though to get back in, into the game as soon as possible. I know that that's up for debate when that will happen but itching to sort of like get back in, involved with the club? Well, I think it's just one of them things. It's, it's, your, it's your life that you've done since I was 16. As I mentioned before, that uh, went from 16 to 48 without sort of um, having a break out of the game. It was continuous all the time, apart from a few weeks where I've lost my job as a manager. But um, it's, it's in your blood. It's what you want to do. I don't know. You get to 50 like I am now and you're thinking, do I want to go through sort of the pressure of being in the management again? On the other side of that, you're thinking, you probably do, because it's all you've ever known. You do miss the buzz of being on the training ground with the players, um, match day situations, the highs and lows. I think the one thing that you've sort of experienced over the last few years of, of, as a manager now is how it's changed dramatically in terms of social media, sort of the pressure, the time spell that you're given at clubs or not given at clubs, the instant results that people are want, it, wanting. And it's, it puts extra pressure on, on everybody that is connected in the football industry. So I've had a good hit at it recent, uh, over the last few years to just see what happens in the future with it all. Have you, have you noticed that change since you've been managing as well? Obviously, um, there were quite a lot of managerial changes when you first came into to management. But has that changed in that time as well? Oh, look, it's changed dramatically even in the last two or three years that social media now plays a massive part in, in, in football and society, that people can sit behind a, a keyboard and, and, and write whatever they want and they can have a massive influence on, on decisions that football clubs make or the welfare of a coach or a, or a player, the negative, the positive side to it all. Um, it, it, it's, it's here to stay. Would I, would I change it? Of course I would because I don't think some of the things that get put out there are right or, uh, or see the proper... Um, have a, a fair reflection on what people are actually doing behind the scenes, whether it's a coach, manager or a player. Um, the criticism is there for everybody to see. Nobody really writes too much about the positive sides in social media, do they? They all want a little bit of a bait to get some sort of de debate going. But it's here, you've got to accept it. I'm not a massive user of social media. And I do say to my players and other people that I'm involved with, just if you're going to go on social media, accept that you're going to be criticised and you've got to have got to be strong enough to deal with these things because I've seen players struggle with it because of the criticism that they've had and they've actually had to come off it because of the negativity towards people and sometimes as I said earlier people don't realise why decisions are made from coaches or managers or even what players are going through behind the scenes that they can sometimes um, look at a situation and think or the players just turning up on a Saturday and, and they've missed an open goal or something like that. But they don't realise sometimes the personal problems that players are going through at that particular time that can sometimes have a, an, an effect on their performances as well. So um, it, it's tough, but it's here to stay, which is uh, a shame. If everybody's a little bit more positive, then I would be a little bit more encouraging social media. Not that these podcasts are obviously... Uh, uh, detrimental to anybody's careers or anything like that. Exactly, but, I was going to say. <laughs> but Twitter and other sort of things can be as well then. Mm, but you, you sort of talked about sort of the, the mental side of it there as well. Is that something you've noticed in the game as well over your, your time like, as a player and, and in management, how that approach towards the game ha has changed in terms of the attitude of, of some 
you know, football clubs it, it, internally as well in terms of how mental health issues are dealt with because obviously it's so prevalent in society now, people struggling with the mental health. Well, definitely. Look, I think these problems have been there for, for many, many years that people have had to deal with things. I just think probably when I look at it in the cold light of day is that maybe when I started out in the 80s as a player, society, people were stronger. They dealt with situations maybe a little bit easier. I think maybe society people are a little bit more precious than they were back when we were all growing up, when we were all younger. But you've got to move with society in the times. And if people are struggling with mental health issues or many other issues, we've got to deal with them. We've got to reach out and support people. And that's why the AFL and many other um, football, uh, sorry, other um, um, professions are dealing with these situations because it is more it's a raising the awareness and ultimately trying to solve the problems that many, many people go through where it wasn't probably highlighted as much in the 80s. People were probably going through the similar sort of problems as I said, maybe not as much, but now it's such a part of social life that people have to be there for each other and help each other. Is it something you personally have to deal with at football club as well? Be, being the manager of a football club, is, is it something which is, is something which you have to you know, deal with on not, not necessarily day-to-day -day basis, but it's part of the job, really? Well, I think the biggest part for a manager is your man manager your players. Forget your tactics and all your and all coaching, etc. I, th I do genuinely believe that the biggest part of a manager is your man manager your players, how you treat them, what each individual needs to get the best out of them. Some need an arm around them, some need a, a little bit of encouragement or sterner words. But ultimately as well, I think we all now are doing things where you try and m make it easier for players to respond and open up to things. We, at clubs that I've had recently, we've had psychologists in, not, you use the word psychologist, that's probably, people use that, look at them type of people and will think that's a little bit too strong. Well, they're there to help people, they're not there because they've got major, major issues, but it's somebody else to talk to. Sometimes players don't want to just talk to a manager or your coaching staff, they want to go into a room and just discuss things that are private, behind scenes, and give people that opportunity, air their views to help them with whatever problems they may have. Mm. I'm going to get back into your management um, <coughs> later on in the interview, but I just want to take you back to the very beginning now. I like to do these interviews quite chronologically. Um, you're obviously a Leeds United fan growing up. Who inspired you to be a footballer and to get involved in the game? Well, I think my, my dad was one of the biggest influence, to be fair. He was um, a school teacher, a PE teacher, played to a good level um, football and cricket. Um, yeah, because he got quite a sporting background. As yeah, well, he 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 had an, he was at Tottenham and a couple of other clubs, but he, back in them days, there wasn't. He went for trials at them clubs, but there wasn't the opportunity or the money really to go into it. So he wanted a secure secure, secure job as as a, a school teacher. But in that time, he was still running all the local area teams, North Yorkshire under 12s, 15s, 16s, and had a big part in a lot of players careers. I think people like Michael Dawson and the Dawson family in general f were, were close to where we grew up and Dad coached them as well and, and managed the teams that he was involved in. And then he did the other side of it in the summer months. He was the, one of the biggest uh, coaches at cricket in the North East or the North of England. And he's taught the likes of Michael Vaughan and uh, many, many other cricketers that have come through to the international scene. And it's sort of he was, he was a big influence, but he never once said to me and my brother, who obviously went into cricket, as played for Yorkshire Essex and got the odd cap for England, this is what I want you to do. It was our choices at the end. We, we had a great opportunity because during the summer holidays, he'd have the keys to the sports hall that we'd go in and practice the football and the cricket. Um, and, and he did encourage us, teach us, showed us the values of what you need to do in the support, in the, so, in the sports. But ultimately it was our decisions, me and my brother, what we wanted to do and up to 16 I could have been a cricketer maybe, I'd played for Yorkshire Skills but the thought of somebody bowling at 90 miles an hour and wrapping it around my head was not sort of my cup of tea. Football all day long and on the reverse Paul preferred that rather than going in for a tackles like I used to do. So we, he guided us but ultimately it was our choice and we've been very fortunate as a, as a family that We've, we've been able to fulfil what we wanted to do when we were teenagers. Mm. As we mentioned, they're a fan of Leeds growing up. Who was your um, like sporting hero from, from that team, though? Because it was a bit of a, 
I suppose you probably missed, time. yeah. I suppose you missed the early seventies era, didn't you? Yeah. You were towards the late seventies, eighties, where Leeds struggled a little bit. In the yeah. League. Well, and I think that's why you would find it hard that when you say about sort of icons of at Leeds United, there wasn't too many around because it was such a bad time, and I used to go and watch other teams play as well at times. So when you look back on the on the Leeds team of there, there isn't one real player that you would say was the one that stood out for you. I think. If you were to be honest, when I'm looking back, I like to watch Liverpool play and people like Kenny Daglish were the, were the heroes at that time. So Ken, Kenny Daglish, even though he wasn't a Leeds player, was probably one of my heroes. Yeah, if you look at look back at that Leeds team, like you said, not many you know, of the, the players in that 70s team really got through to that era, did not they? Really, no, no, they're not really remembered that well, No, no. I mean, Eddie Gray was probably past his peak by the time, I yeah. suppose, you watched, watched um, Leeds play. But... Um, like I mentioned, you come from that sporting background. Was there ever a thought for you, though, that you, I know you've touched on it, but in terms of that, that cricket experience, obviously your brother, like you said, went on to, to do so well and went on to be a coach as well. Was there ever any thought for you to, to go in, into cricket? Did you have you know ambitions there as well? Or? Not really, because I was always really, football was my number one sport. If, if it looked like I wasn't going to be given an apprenticeship at Leeds at 16, then it might have been something that in the... The year before, I might have taken it a little bit more seriously and worked a little bit hard, but harder at it. But at 14, I was a schoolboy at Leeds with always the intentions that I was probably going to get an apprenticeship. Um, <clears throat> but there were still no guarantees that you're going to be able to make it a, in a career in it. And then, then two years as an apprentice at Leeds, is I look back with so much fondness and, and the experiences that have made me as a person. You leave home at 16, even though Bido was an hour and a bit away from Leeds, you leave home. At 16, it's like going into digs and you're in digs with two or three other lads who were in your youth team. You then had the privilege, but also the, the grind of um, cleaning the dressing rooms of the coaches. And the coach there was Billy Bremner, who was one of the most famous players to have played for Leeds, an icon. And I would clean his boots. I'd be sweeping out his uh, the dressing room where, where he got changed, the coaching staff. and. I, w I would take longer than I would ever imagine because I was just listening to the stories. He'd be sat down talking to his other staff about maybe training, but then all of a sudden he'd go into the mode of, of what they did back in his day playing and the stuff like that. And it was just, it was like fascinating to listen to the stories. And, and the one thing about Billy was that he loved his, he loved his football, that I would sweep the corridors, but there's this one area, which was the gym area, <clears throat> where sometimes you get like 15, 18 players in and just do a circle. The number of times that I would sweep it, that I mop it out, and then after I'd finished it, Billy would say, right, get the ball out, we're gonna have a little circle again, like where you're chasing it in the middle. I'm like, I've just, I've just cleaned this up and had to do it all again. And, and one of the memories that I got from when Billy was there at Leeds was, we were doing a, a five-a-side, seven-a-side one day, and he stood in his suit with his shoes on, and uh, he's watching training happen for the youth team. And then all of a sudden, he joins in. He's playing in his suit and shoes and still the best player on the pitch. And that was just like Billy because he loved his football. And it was fascinating that at 14, I was signed by Eddie Gray as a schoolboy. 16, signed as a, a, a pro by, Eddie, uh, by uh, Billy Bremner. It was uh, two of the icons of Leeds United. Yeah, two real legends of, of the game there. Um, I know most people listening will think of you as, as a manager. But how will you describe back then as a raw player what Simon Grayson w was like to come up against? Well, I, I was fortunate. I made my debut at 17, which was, I was playing the youth team on a Saturday. Um, and then on the Tuesday night, I went to the, got told that I was playing in the first team on the Tuesday night in a, in a dour nil-nil draw. Came off after about 70 minutes with cramp. But I was always, like I've always tried to be for the last 30 odd years when I've been involved, appreciate that I'm in a very privileged position. But I was always a hard-working lad that wanted to, to do, do the best of his capabilities. And um, I think when I look at what I did, I wouldn't have minded as a manager having somebody like myself as a player because, one, I was, I was a good professional, I thought. I could work hard in training every day. I would give my all. I wouldn't sort of um, sulk too much if I was left out of the team. So, in a way, I was I always thought that as long as I give everything every day, whether it's a manager or, or as a player, then <coughs> I could have no regrets in what I was going to do. 
and it was. I went through some tough times. I made my debut at 17 and only played probably another couple of times for Leeds until I was 21 and, and I moved to Leicester. But the, the growing up period that I had in that particular time and learned so much about yourself, but from other people, <coughs> excuse me, at that time Gordon Strachan came into Leeds and Gordon had a massive influence on a lot of us young pros that were at Leeds at the time that myself, um, Gary Speed, we, we signed at 14 together, I mean, Speedo and David Batty was another one that Gordon would just offer his advice. He'd give us a kick up the backside at times because he might watch us in a reserve game and say, look, you're better than this, you can do this, you can do that. And he was a major driving force under the young players that came through at Leeds at that particular time. But regarding my style of play, I, could, I played numerous positions, full-back, centre-midfield, centre-back, even then, and I carried that right the way through my career once I became a professional. Yeah, so he put out a picture of uh, Gordon Strachan giving the referee some grief as yeah. well, so <laughs> he didn't let anyone uh, escape him, did he? But um, in terms of, you, you touched on your debut there, but what was that moment like for you when, when you did get to pull on that, that Leeds United shirt, obviously a boyhood dream? It was, like when I got told on the Saturday, that I was going to, uh, sorry, on the Tuesday that I was going to be playing, it was... It's all you dreamt about doing. As, a, as somebody who wanted to be a footballer, to make your debut, every player up and down the country worldwide will always remember the debut and the, how nervous you felt, how the game went. You, you don't always remember too much of it because it was like you're just caught up in the game and it just passes you by at times. And as I said, I, I can't remember too much about how, if I had too much influence. Or, as I mentioned earlier, not, I just remember thinking... I've got cramp here, I'm going to have to come off soon because I've run around like headless chicken trying to do the best you can. But I remember it was in a, the yellow kit with a Burton on the front and it was a Leeds United icon shirt at that time. So, was Vinnie Jones in the team at that time? Uh, right? No, Vinnie didn't come to, no, he, he was three or four years later yeah. on. So in that team you would have had people like Mervyn Day was in goal. Um, I think John Styles might have been alongside me in midfield. Peter had it. Um, just trying to think now, who else? Um, Vince Lair might have been in it as well, Noel Blake. So there was sort of lads that had been round the block, but I, I didn't care who was alongside me. I know that I'd, nobody could ever take away that you'd made your debut for the team that you supported. And one tick, one tick was off the list of things that I wanted to try and accomplish when I started, when my heart was set on being a footballer. Was it Billy Bremner as well who gave you your debut yeah, back then? Yeah. Yes, I'm guessing that must have been a... Yeah, and I wore the number four shirt, which he, oh, he wow. wore all the time as well, and played in centre midfield. Unfortunately, I didn't play as many games for Leeds <laughs> as Billy did. No, um, <laughs> but um, just talk to us as well. Obviously, a lot gets talked about in, in terms of Leeds' history, the, the influence that Howard Wilkinson had during that time. What, what was that like? I mean, obviously, you didn't play very much for him, did you? But what, what was the shift like when, when he did take over? Because obviously Leeds became successful again for that period. Completely different. Billy was sort of relaxed about the whole situation. It was more seven aside like they probably did under Dom Revy and, and other sort of um, managers that Billy worked under where Howard came in and it was very structured. A lot more physical side of it, a lot more running. The players had to get fitter. There was a lot more work done on <coughs> in terms of set pieces of how they were going to play. Probably Howard was a little bit ahead of his time compared to a lot of the coaches in that day. That he he was very structured, organised what he was doing, and it took a bit of time for people to to try and adjust to that. I remember David Batty would be in the team, and Howard was wanting to do set pieces on a Friday before the game, and Bats would be just ki have this ball and be kicking it into the back of the net where <coughs> Gordon's trying to take uh, free kicks and, and corners. To it come to the point that on a Friday, Howard just said to Bats, there's your ball, you go down to the bottom end, you know what you're doing, you're not disrupting the rest of the session. And that's sort of what Howard brought to the club and the organisation and the structure. And basically what we brought a winning mentality to the group, which, which obviously laid the foundations for, uh, for the success that he brought to the club. Mm, and obviously went on to get promotion then. The title as well, but you, you left the club um, shortly before they won that last first division title, as it was then. Um, was there any sense of regret or you know, sadness about leaving the club during that season, or was it just you just really wanted to play? No, I, look, I, I was realistic that I, I knew I was not going to play. I think Howard had brought in John Newsom, he brought in um, Ray Wallace, playing fullback at the time. Gary Kelly was just coming through as well. and. I'd not played much over the years, so as much as I was part of the squad that was travelling around, I think it was this day and age, I'd have been sub 
unused many, many times because it, there was all back then it was one and two subs. But ultimately, I knew that I had to go and start my career again. And I had a tear in my eye when I left. I got the call. The Leicester thing was had been on the cards for a few months, and then it didn't quite happen. And as it happened, actually, I was subbed the night before down at QPR. And um, funny stories as we walk, as Howard turned to the bench, two, he said, "You two go and warm up." So got up, and as you can imagine, three, four thousand away fans in there. And they all started singing, singing and cheering. So I turned to the lad on the right and said, that'll be for me, in a joking sort of manner. <coughs> and he didn't quite understand what I'd said. Anyway, the person to the right of me was Eric Cantona. Um, so it was sort of quite ironic that I was, my last day at Leeds United was, was with Eric as a sub and got the call the next morning, went to pick my boots up and everything. I had a tear in my eyes as I left, but certainly knew that I had to move on because I wanted to get my career on, on track. And as it panned out, 11 games or so later, after signing for Leicester, I'm, play, I'm in the playoff final. Yeah, just, I mean, we'll get on to your relationship with the, the playoffs later on, but what, <laughs> what was, you know, that first taste of it like for you, you know, compared to the majority of, you know, reserve team football then to playing in a, a massive game like that, one of the, of course, even back then, probably one of the biggest games in football. It was it was what I'd wanted to do from the 10-11 league games that we had to them playing Cambridge. You were a good time, a good team in that semi-final. The likes of P and Dublin, Lee Philpot, Phil Chapel, and people like that they were a good team at that time, and we knew that we were in for a tough game. And uh, we had, we beat them in the semi-final. Um, I managed to contribute to one of the goals in the in the Holton leg, the second leg. Then before you know it, you're thinking, wow, we're going to be playing at Wembley in, in front of. 70 odd thousand in what is the equivalent of the championship playoff final now which is as we all know one of the biggest one-off games in sport and to try and get to to the Premier League as it was going to be the following year was going to be some some uh, incentive for us all um, and again I just remember that particular game that it was red hot I was marking Gordon Cowan's and Gordon was probably in his mid-30s and he was as good as anybody on the day and I was chasing him and I was like absolutely blowing because I couldn't get the ball off him. And at that time, Blackburn were the team that Dad Gleish, Kenny was in charge of the team, Jack Walker had spent a lot of money for them to try and get out of the division and they were the clear favourites. And unfortunately, we lost 1-0 to a, a dubious penalty of David Speedy, even to this day, he'll say that he dived and, and got Blackburn promoted. But... Uh, Fantastic experience and a proud moment for your parents who've worked a long time, waited a long time to see you play in a big game, but ultimately then playing at the home of English football was, was fantastic for myself and all my family that were there that particular day. Mm, played under uh, Brian Little as well. Yeah. I, see, I mean, somebody who went on again to play for later in your career as well, Aston Villa, how much influence has he had on your career as well? And, you know, in taking it into management, I suppose. As well. Yeah, but definitely. And I, I think... All the managers that I worked under, I've, I've tried to take out the good points and the, and, the, and the bad points into my coaching and managing career. But Did you do that from a young age as well? Yeah, I, th I tried to take on board what people were saying, how I thought, trying to understand into the game. I just didn't turn up on a, a training and then disappear and not try and learn from every everything that we did. Um, and there's so many different types of people that you were you were learning from. But Brian played played a big part in my career because... He was the youth team coach at Middlesbrough when we used to play against them when I was at Leeds and I said to him when, I th when he signed me on that particular day, when I was the Leicester manager, I said, how come you knew about me in that? He said, well, I've watched you in the reserves, but also I managed you. I was impressed when you played in the youth team against my teams and that, and that sort of his recognition of how he kept an eye on me for two or three years to see how I developed and ultimately took the plunge and I think spent £50,000 on me, which... Um, doesn't sound a lot of money this day and age, but uh, any money spent back in the early 90s was, was quite a bit of money. Um, and so he, he did, he played a big part. Different type of character as a, as a person, very laid back, sort of um, had great man management skills. Um, and I loved working for him. And, and that period of time at Leicester, under him and other managers that uh, came and went as well, I think in the six years I had at Leicester, we had five playoff finals, um, no, four playoff finals, a relegation from the Premier League and then a League Cup win um, as well. So it was a real, 
Fantastic. What trips to Wembley? Yeah, it was. It was like I said, the first year we'd lost to Blackburn, the second year we lost to Swindon, the third year we beat Derby, and I was fortunate that I was the captain that day. So again, another experience of 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 being able to walk up them famous steps and lift the trophy. The first Leicester captain ever to win at Wembley was sort of seeing people playing FA Cup finals not win and then to have that privilege of lifting a trophy. I wore a stupid beanie hat, which I'm, to this day I do regret wearing. Um, but then the following year we um, we got relegated from the Premier League. Got rele Then we got promoted again against Crystal Palace. I think Steve Clarence Shin won in in the last 10 seconds of of, a, of a uh, extra time, which meant we got to the Premier League, and then the following year we won the we finished ninth or tenth in the Premier League and won the League Cup, and it was like everything happened for the Leicester supporters during them early years of the nineties, and even after that when I left, they had two other visits to the to the the League Cup final. It was an incredible time for Leicester City and for us as players because we had a close bond of group of players that experienced a lot of lows by losing in the finals, but. We had to experience a lot of highs as well by winning them. Mm, and, and, and for you, I've touched on like your relationship with the, the playoffs, but what do you prefer, or what have you preferred more, your experience as a player in, in those games, or as a manager, what, what's better out of the two, would you say? Uh, different sort of pressure. It's different, yeah, there's different pressure. As a player, you just concentrate on what you're trying to do within that team ethic of what you're how you can influence it, how you, what you're going to do for your teammate, are you going to cover him, are you going to make a tackle, are you going to find a pass for him. So you are within that framework of the group, whereas a manager, most of that work leading into the final is the key part of what you've done in terms of the match day, the preparation of the work that we're doing, the build up to the game, how we're going to play, how as a manager you're going to control the, the emotions of the players. Because I remember the Blackburn game, it sort of passed me by where I wanted to learn, get my players to feel that experience, what I've had, and try and pass that on to them. Say, look, we're here to work. Try not to influence the, have outside of interests um, and in influences that can not not allow you to perform the best capabilities. Because ultimately, you're going to a final, and the only one thing you want to do is is win it. And so, as a manager, you're doing all the preparation leading into the game. It's like any other game as well as a, as a coach, as a manager. As soon as players cross that line, you are very sort of limited in what you can get across to the players because, especially in a playoff final, you've got 50, 60, 70,000 people there. So you're not going to get too much across to them. So it's what you've done in the build-up and at half-time um, and passing on your valuable experiences that you've learnt from as a, as a player previously. And as you say, in your final year at Leicester <coughs> winning, the League Cup as well, and you scored the winning goal in the semi-finals as well, which obviously a lot of people won't know now, but just how special a year was, was that for you in, in general? You were, I think you were player of the season that, that year as well. Just, just talk us through how you know how you were as a player then. Was that you at your peak then? Was that the highlight of, of your career, would you say? Um, it was Being at Leicester was a memorable time for all the th reasons that we've just spoke about and the visits that we had to, to, to Wembley and the competitions that we're involved in. And, and that particular year, 97, was a fantastic year, as you mentioned there, that I was playing regularly, um, scoring the semi-final of the FA Cup, and I didn't score many goals. So to it score, must be the most important. It, so it, was, it certainly was by a country mile, <laughs> and all the other ones were in, insignificant, really. <laughs> all the other 12, I think it was, or something like that. But um, I always remember Steve Claridge telling me um, when it went in, and I think, I, I, fell to the floor. People think I was doing a Jurgen Klinsmann. I didn't. I literally turned and fell and then the lads just jumped on me and he said, you don't want anybody else to score now because you're going to get all the credit and all the headlines the next day. And that was Claridge. He, he was a striker and they're all selfish looking yeah. for all the headlines. <laughs> Us defenders just did the nitty gritty. So you did that and it was, it was a fantastic feeling to score in the semi-final. But I always remember the build up to the final that we played Middlesbrough who were Janino, uh, Ravenelli, Emerson and good British lads playing as well. They were going to be clear favourites. We played them at Filbert Street and we were 3-0 down at half-time and, and Martin O'Neill decided at the time at half-time that we had to make sure that we didn't lose by any more because we were playing them a few weeks later. Psychologically, we could have really harmed us. So the second half of the game, he, he said to me, will you man-mark Janino? I'm like, great, at least it's only 45 <laughs> minutes. Anyway, the game just panned out that we lost 3-0, I think it was. But the lead up to the final was all about are we going to man-mark Janino? And I'm thinking, please, if we are, do not 
be me because I don't I, <coughs> I don't envisage running around Wembley and just man marking Janino because of the big open spaces and and what what job that you had to do. I would have done it because it's an unselfish task that you had to do for the team. But so about two days before Martin named the team and he said. Um, Pontus Kamak, you're going to man Mark Giannini and I'm like, oh happy days, that'll do me, I can just play right back and do with the job and deal with whoever I need to be playing against and let Pontus go and Mark Giannini and, and he did a fantastic job to be fair and we went into the replay and fought the one managed to come through with, as winners. Yeah, la the last replay as well in the League Cup final, was that a bit strange going to, to Hillsborough? I suppose it's not the, the same feeling as going to, to Wembley, is it? I th yeah, but I think if you ask any player, any supporter, we won the trophy, we lifted it up there and got to the top of the stairs and you just turned to the, the cop end at, at Hillsborough, full of blue and white, and it was just a, a fantastic feeling. So, look, in an ideal world, you'd love to have won the trophy at Wembley, but we, we didn't score till late on, I think, and managed to, to, to nick the replay. So, look, you lifted the trophy up and... It's all that people remember. That's all people remember, definitely. Mm. And then, of <coughs> course, you earned that move to Aston Villa um, after being the player of the season. How, how did the move come about? Obviously, we mentioned earlier, Brian Little was a fan of yours. Well, it was strange, really, because I'd, I was getting out of contract and um, went to see Martin a couple of times. And he said, look, we, we're in the middle of this run now of the League Cup that will sort your contract out. And so it got to sort of the back end of the season after the Cup had finished and my agent would go down to Leicester to see Martin and Martin had gone home. He'd forgot that we was having this meeting and that was just Martin for you. He was quite sort of relaxed in what he did. And so it just got to the end of the season and I didn't, I wasn't, I had no intention that I'd be going anywhere else because as I said, Leicester was my home, we enjoyed what we're doing. And... But then it, pa it just panned out that when Martin, um, Brian rung me and said, we want to sign you at Aston Villa. And when a club like Aston Villa, and no disrespect to Leicester, was a top four club, they, they, they were in the top four, it qualified for Europe. Um, it was just another, what I thought was another step up in, in where I wanted to get to be, get to as, a, as another player, as a player, should I say. Um, and that summer, Aston Villa signed Stan Collymore for... I think it was seven and a half million. I went for just under two million pound and it was sort of, right, this is another step up of maybe one I want to get to. I had aspirations of maybe trying to play for England as well and maybe I thought by doing that, by going to Aston Villa might be allow me to do that. That never proved the case and I probably wasn't good enough to play for England but you've obviously got to try and set the, set the benchmark high um, and you go there and I always remember ring, ringing Martin up because in them days you got out of contract you could just walk out and you'd go to a tribunal unless you agreed a fee whereas now there's people are doing this doing that and I rang Martin up to explain my decision why I wanted to go to Aston Villa anyway I got a message back from his secretary which we can't repeat <laughs> um, of, of his reasons uh, telling me what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing and uh, but that's just he was disappointed because he wanted to keep me because I'd I'd done well for him and he'd done well for me as well. And the thing about Martin was, within two, three months of me going to Aston Villa, he was trying to buy me back again, which just shows you that he falls out with you for three, four months and then he tries to buy you back. And the ironic thing, I suppose, about it all was that I went to Aston Villa and the first game of the season was back at Filbert Street and it was like, oh, great, I'm going to get pelters from the manager, <laughs> the players and some of the supporters, but uh, that's just part and parcel of football. I mean, you've touched on <coughs> Martin quite a lot there, I've heard a few stories about Martin in terms of his character. He could be quite, he could have peculiar methods, I should say. Were there any examples of that during his time at Oh, yeah, at plenty. And there'll be a few that we can't repeat on <laughs> here as well. Um, he, was, he was a throwback, was Martin. You Nigel Clough influence, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, Brian Clough. Brian Clough, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, m massively. That Martin wasn't one for doing sort of loads and loads of coaching with the team. He had Steve Walford, who was a good coach that would do that. John Robertson was his assistant, who was really the other side of the coin, that it was just five aside, seven aside, give you days off. And Martin wouldn't turn up for training two or three days of the week. But the one thing that you knew was going to happen, when he walked onto that training pitch, training just went up 10, 20% because of the aura that he had about him. And it's exactly, when you listen to people, what Brian Clough did as well. And, and we do things that, you look back on now, you're thinking, we can't have done that as a player. We can't have gone into the League Cup final 
go to Grantham for two days before the semi-final and not train. And it was like, but it just had this method that had worked for, for Brian Clough that he thought worked for us, and it did. And that's why there's no correct way of dealing with, with training. It's getting the best out of your group of players. And we would, we'd all run through a brick wall for Martin, and that's testament to sort of his ideas and, and his philosophies. We would, we'd go to trips down to Bournemouth for three days, take a training kit, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't train. And we'd go out socially, and he'd have a curfew for us, to 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and you come back into the hotel. And we did, when he told us to do stuff, we, we, we stuck to that, more or less. <laughs> and, but he would be sat in reception having a drink, and as we all came back, he'd made you all stay there, and he wouldn't let you go to bed and it, until he said, right, you can go to bed now. So we'd be, there was a curfew, but then there was another curfew once we got back into the hotel. And that was just his, his style and it was, it was great to work with. And I'll go back to your time at <laughs> Aston Villa, focusing on that. Um, you mentioned earlier about the chance to play in Europe as well. What was that experience like for you? Obviously, you did quite well in the UEFA Cup that season. Yeah. Against Atletico Madrid. Yeah, there was, uh, there was, I think we got to the quarter-final in the end. Um, and we, we'd played, I think we played Bordeaux as well and uh, we're in Romania as well. And it was just a new experience for us all. And that's one of the reasons why I went. It's a good um, one to tick off the career list, isn't yeah, it? Play yeah, to play, to play in Europe against sort of some of the best players. I remember playing against a player called Kiko, who was a Spanish international at the time, and he didn't shout for the ball. They just started this game, and all of a sudden there's whistling going off. And his teammates obviously responded to wherever he was on the pitch. It's like this whistle came out. And we, I think for 10 minutes, us as defenders are thinking, What's what's all this whistling going around? It was just a communication that he had with his teammates. But it was like you played against Bordeaux and Papa and the French international. It was just another level of sort of where you wanted to get to as a player. Mm, and, and you worked obviously at Aston Villa for that that, that season. Um, worked in a back four, which was you know, quite a famous sort of back four. The likes of Hugo Ecchio, the likes of Gareth Southgate. What was it like to be part of such a you know a, a strong unit like that? Well, it was strange, really, because Brian Little, when I was at Leeds, I played midfield a lot, and only sort of when I got to about 20, I ended up playing right back. So then I went, so I'd be playing predominantly um, at right back in the latter stages at Leeds. Then I went to back to, then I went to Leicester, and Martin, uh, sorry, Brian put me back into midfield. And then Martin played me at right back, right wing back. And then I moved to Aston Villa and Martin played me, sorry, so I'm getting confused. <laughs> Brian played me at Leicester as a, as a midfield player. Martin then moved me to right back and, and right wing back. And then Brian signed me for Aston Villa and I played more times in midfield where I'd just been player of the year, the year before, playing full back. And it was because Gary Charles was playing at right back. So we would, I'd play centre back in a, in a three sometimes with Hugo and, and Gareth, Steve Staunton. There some real, we had some real good players at, at Aston Villa at that time that obviously have gone on to have fantastic careers in the Premier League, but as, as managers and coaches now as well. And it was a, 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 good, a good group of players and um, you try to have your influence on that team. But I think maybe at Leicester, I was probably more of a, I was a regular week in and week out, which probably when I went to Aston Villa, I found it a little bit more difficult to deal with because I was sometimes in and out of the team and you might not get back in for three or four games, maybe longer. And it was sort of, that was a hard part to adjust to when you've played a long time, but certainly played with some good good players and some good characters. Was, was that part of the reason for moving on <coughs> to Blackburn then? Was it just to get first team football? Yeah, I, I had two years there and, and Brian had left and John Gregory, who was Brian's first team coach at Leicester at the time when I first signed, had gone off to manage and then came back as a coach and then took Brian's job. Um, and the team had done well, people, but the club was evolving and moving on. The likes of um, Paul Merson had signed, Steve Watson had then been bought to play right back and you got Alan Thompson midfield and it was just moving on all the time. So I was, I was enjoying being there and part of the group, but again, just as any time, you want to be playing. And my son had just been born um, that March time before I left in the summer. I just felt that it was an opportunity to move back home or closer to home to, to, into the Blackburn area. So it all worked. Blackburn were a big club, even though they'd just been relegated from the Premier League. Um, they were going into the Championship to be one of the favourites to get back to the Premier League. So I didn't see it really as a step down. It was a step down, but I thought it would only be for one year, thinking that Blackburn might be back in the Premier League very quickly. Mm. And, and that first season, obviously, you, you did play a lot of the games, but after that, 
struggled again to get into the team. W was that, I know you mentioned moving <coughs> back into the area, was it a bit of a, again, a little bit of a, a regret to the move because of that? Because you, you had a lot of loan spells, obviously, after that. Well, the, it's not until you sort of, you, you see things in a different light or hear things, why the reasons why certain things, and this is, again boils down to the things that I spoke about, that taking good things and good um, good things and, and bad points from managers that I worked under. Brian Kidd signed me in the first place, but fortunately we didn't have a great start to the season. Then uh, Graham Souness came in, who had his own ideas, brought his own players in, um, and ultimately you respect that, but you did want to be treated uh, with a little bit of respect. And we, there was a group of us that he felt would no no need to his first team that we'd gone train with a reserve team coach. And that group that was there, it was, it was as good as team. We could have played out the first team at Blackburn and been and probably beat them. The likes of Billy McKinley, Nathan Blake, sometimes Lee Carsley, Christian Daly. These lads were I, I got bought for to Blackburn for a million pound, but people like Christian were five six million. Lee Carsley, um, sometimes Nathan Blake was there. Eggy Lostenstad was another one, and we we had this group that were. <laughs> A little bit isolated and, and cast out at times, um, which I didn't agree with, and it's something that I've never really tried to do as a manager because I feel that if you're there, you've still got to incorporate them. And if you don't play, well, that's just part and parcel of it. But I've never been one for really isolating it out players. And then a real, then you find out as well once you leave the club that that there's a clause in my contract if I played one more game, they had to go and play Aston Villa another couple of hundred thousand pound, which you don't realise at the time. Um, and these things, I suppose, do happen in football that um, you can have no influence on at times. And you mentioned the loan deals that I went. I just wanted to go and play football, so I went to Stockport, who were in the championship at the time, Sheffield Wednesday, Bradford, all in the championship, because I wanted to, not to count as another one. So I just wanted to go and play football. I was just, all I wanted to do was play football. I didn't want to be sat doing nothing, picking up my money, playing in reserve games, or just training six or seven of us because it was, that's not what you want to do. Is that the worst thing about being a player when you aren't getting picked and you know, consistently week in, week out, you're watching other people on the pitch playing in front of... Yeah, I, I always remember that one year when I wasn't part of the Blackburn squad that the actual group got promoted back to, back to the Premier League and it was like, you couldn't be happy. I would not say I wasn't happy for my teammates, but you couldn't enjoy it because I, you were no part of it. You know what I mean? You you, you weren't playing any games. You, you just had no sort of feeling for the club getting promoted. I was pleased for my teammates who I got on with, like Alan Kelly, Craig Short, Craig England, and all them sort of lads. We were good lads and still remain in touch with now. And but when you're not part of something, it doesn't feel that special moments. And um, yeah, it, it it was a learning experience. But sometimes things are taken out of your hands, aren't they? You mentioned they moved on to, to Blackpool <coughs> after that. What was the uh, what was the thinking behind that move for you? Obviously, an, another step down into League One at the time. The of League yeah, League. well, it was one of them that I was, what, 31, 32, I think I was, that I had a chance to go to QPR, but I didn't want to, at that age, go down to London. I didn't want to sort of leave my newborn son. who was probably three or four then at the time. Um, and Steve McMahon rang me and said, do you want to come and play at Blackpool? And at first you thought, I'm not quite sure because I want to try and stay in the championship. But I thought, well, it's close to home. Let's see where it takes us. And three and a bit years of playing regular football, winning the LDV Cup at, um, at Cardiff, another great experience and being captain of, of that group. And um, then ultimately um, playing regularly again and finishing your career because I didn't, I'd had enough of not playing. I just wanted to go and play somewhere and it worked it worked perfectly. And one of the thoughts was that I maybe would go into coaching sometime down the line and that may be an opportunity for me. And how much did you enjoy captaining your teams as well? And especially captaining them to, you know, success, relative success with, you know, you mentioned so many playoff finals you've played and, uh, and obviously won the EFL Cup as well, EFL Trophy as well. Yeah, look, it was, I was always captain of the youth team when I was at Leeds in front of Batty and Speed and people like that. Maybe people saw me that I was a leader, couldn't, whether it was by example or by talking to people onto the pitch. Good, hopefully that people would look up to me and think, well, he trains well in training every day and he's got a good influence on, on, on other people around him. I don't know. I just It was just something that I thought, 
or people thought that was quite good at doing. So does it transfer into management as well in, in terms of the you know, transferable skills of being a captain to, to being a manager? Yeah, I think so because as a manager, you, you've got to you've got these leadership qualities, and hopefully you've got them qualities that you need to take and express out to your players and them them leadership qualities as a player you can draw from as you go into a managing side of it all there's there's certainly a lot more instances you have to deal with and and they're completely different from a playing perspective but um yeah even if i didn't have an armband on me when i was playing it was always trying to influence cajole players and, and get the best out of them and use them experiences as a player then to learn from to 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 go into my managing career mm. and of course that opportunity came at Blackpool as a caretaker. How does how does an opportunity like that present itself to you? Do you put yourself forward to be a caretaker, <laughs> or what, what was the situation like? Well, I certainly didn't put myself forward for it. Um, I was doing all my badges at the time, um, and as it happened, Steve McMahon left one, I think, before the last game of the season, and Carl Oyston, the owner at the time, just said, "Look, it's the last game of the season. You're the most experienced player." Um, will you take the team? And so we went to Bristol City and had one day to take the training. So it wasn't, and there was nothing riding on the game. Um, and I was uh, still only 34, I think, something like that, maybe not even that. And it, and enjoyed the day, but it was just one game. It was nothing. And then as it happened, people were saying, why don't you go for the job in the summer? I'd, but I wasn't ready for it. I'd done my badges. I'd not even taken any reserve games or anything like that. <coughs> and then Colin Hendry came into the job and I was out of contract as well. And he said, look, stay on, still play, predominantly one year as a player, but also take the reserves. And it gave me an opportunity to, to learn how to deal with players that you, I think most people find the hardest part as a coach is, is getting your ideas across and talking to players in general and in a dressing room as well. But didn't take too many of the sessions because it was more, I was still part of playing there. But it was it was a fantastic grooming experience for me because it's I was not the ideal situation and it's becoming to, to yeah happen. I remember ex the experiences of playing in the first team for Blackpool down at Bournemouth and getting home at four o'clock in the morning having to drive to Bloomfield Road unfortunately I had a four by four pick up the balls bibs and cones take some of the kit to, to I don't know Rochdale or somewhere like that for a one o'clock kickoff and I'm like shattered from the night before full of the bag and um, setting out the kit in the dressing rooms and this was sort of a real sort of experience of what might entail further down the line and Carl uh, Washington getting into value for what yeah he well certainly what well, yeah, he certainly <laughs> did for that um, but it was it was an experience for me because some managers now are, ex are, are fortunate they might just go or, or maybe not fortunate they can go straight from playing into first team management um, but that certainly gave me um, um, an opportunity to experience what the real nitty gritty is. That you've got poles in your car, and all of a sudden you're driving, and you slam on the gear, and you're nearly hit by one of the poles that coming through the back <laughs> of your car. Uh, it, it was a, it was an experience which certainly helped me um, for the rest of my career as a manager coach. Mm. And, and you obviously eventually got the job as well. Um, how did that sort of come about you you actually getting the job on, on a permanent basis af after that obviously in quite difficult circumstances as well well I was doing all my badges at the time um, and just learning from the, the um, being the role of the reserve team manager and then I just felt that at th I think I was nearly 35 and I'm thinking I want to do something different I'm nearly ready for packing in playing and I got I got a call from somebody and says will you come and be my assistant manager we've been on the courses together I just felt that it was the right time for me to do it I could have played on for another year but felt maybe in another year I might not get this opportunity to be a coach so I thought well I'll, I'll do that so I went to Colin Hendry and said to Colin look I've got this opportunity I'm gonna I'm gonna pack in playing do you mind if I if I take this decision he said no but what you need to do is is go and speak to Carl Oyster the owner and, and ask him for permission to cancel your contract so I went to see Carl and <laughs> And I said to Carl, I've got this opportunity, can I go? And he went, no. And I was like amazed. I'm thinking, I've been quite loyal here. I've done the reserves. I've played over 100 games. And I said, why? He says, well, I'm sacking Colin and you're taking over. <laughs> and that sort of, I fell into it. It was, I never really thought that I would go from a player stroke reserve team manager to a first team 
manager. I thought I'd do the in-between, a first-team coach, assistant manager for somebody, and then see if I could take the next step to be a manager. But I was thrown into it. I didn't have any choice into it. And it was sort of, um, I thought, well, I've got this opportunity now as a caretaker. I either decide that I want to do it long-term and in the future, or I'll just do it a couple of games. And, and I just thought, why not give it the best shot? It's something that I've worked with doing my badges that I'd see how it works, see where it can take me. And and it was it wasn't easy because I was going from a dressing room of some of my close friends to me to then dropping them on a Saturday and having to explain to them why I'm doing it. And it was like I I had to be ruthless in, in making them decisions because no disrespect to them, I, if I was going to be a success, I had to make decisions that are not going to be ones that everybody's going to enjoy, but it's either going to be me successful in the job I want to do for a long term or, or just keep friends with certain players. And hopefully the players that I, weren't, I wasn't picking were going to be respectful that they knew exactly the reasons why they're doing it. And, and it wasn't easy. You have, you have what, I think it was November, December time I took over. It wasn't until the following summer that we managed to, I kept the team up. Um, and I got the job permanently. It was like a caretaker for three or four months. I must have thought it was going to be an easy job because the first game was on Sky and we beat Scunthorpe, I think it was 5-2, 4-2 or something like that. I thought, oh, this managing career can't be too hard because we've, it's, if it's going to be like this every week, then I'll take that. But got offered it in the, in the summer on a permanent basis. And that's, that's when you had to make some even more ruthless decisions. I was like letting players go, I wasn't extending the contracts who would be my best friends because I thought they're not going to be take this football club forward and do what I want to do. And I always remember one player saying to me, who was friends with, I said, look, he said, you're not going to get a centre-half as good as me. So I reminded him a couple of years later, I said, I got two when I released you, I got <laughs> signed two better centre-halves. And yeah, you just had to make decisions that were going to, well, prove to yourself that you could handle being a manager. Do you make players speak differently at that point to you? Do you get them to call you gaffer? What, what's the situation there? Are you <laughs> still, still Simon in the changing room? What, what's the, what's the uh, situation? Yeah, I, I didn't sort of, from, I didn't go from suddenly being a player to care, take a manager, right, you've got to call me gaffer, you've got to call me boss. I think it was more sort of... I suppose it's quite awkward, isn't it? Yeah, I think the one big thing that I did at the time was I brought Tony Parks in with me, who was caretaker manager first team coach at Blackburn for a number of years who I'd worked with and he was my calming influence and, and would do things so I think I think when Tony came in it was all about sort of right this is now your first you're the first team manager he would say maybe to the players look he's a manager now he's not your mate you've got to respect that he's this is what you've got to call him so it wasn't sort of me saying right you've got to go and do this call me this that and the other I think it's more Tony's influence on on players that um that would suggest that what they needed to be calling me. Look, they call me manager boss to me first. They were calling me plenty of other things behind it without shadow doubt. <laughs> like, probably like most bosses. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, well, obviously you secured that promotion as well, again, through <coughs> the, the playoffs in your second season. Um, just, just tell me how proud of you were of that achievement. Now, look, looking back, obviously you've got a lot more experience as a manager now, but being a you know, raw manager in, in League One at that time, how, how special was that for you? Well, I don't think you, you expected something like to happen so quickly in your time. I said the previous season was all about staying up and then we built this group together. But my first, I remember my first 10 games at Blackpool as, as a permanent manager, I think I won one in 10. And one in 10 now would probably lead to you getting the sack. And back then you did get a lot more time to, to develop the group. And, and try and have a, get your ideas across and hopefully get over the difficult spells. And, and it was one of them seasons where momentum played a massive part in it. We, we were playing well at times, you get results, but it wasn't until probably the back end of that particular season that we won the last seven games of the season on the trot and got into the playoff semi-finals, played Oldham, beat them um, both games. And so all of a sudden you're going to Wembley in your first full season as a manager and you um, played Yeovil and beat them 2-0. And it was like to win 10 games on the trot at any stage of, of a season was, was, was a good achievement. But then to do it when it really mattered the business end, that you'd seven league wings, the playoffs and, and then the final was 
just a great feeling to experience for a club that had not had a lot of success previously, um, but to do it so early in my career, it was like, wow, this is... You think it was easy? <laughs> well, <laughs> I've, I've, I've now realised that managing <laughs> isn't as easy as maybe in my early years, but it was, uh, it was a great feeling and, and it, immensely proud because as a player, <clears throat> you do think about yourself. That's all you think about, really, and your teammates that you're out there on the pitch with. But as a manager, you've got the hopes and, and prayers of everybody on the pitch to like however many supporters are out there supporting you from your board of directors, your owners. There's a lot as you as a manager that is all these decisions are in your hands of can make or break a football club. Yeah, a lot of uh, important sort of responsibility you've got yeah. there, isn't there? Um, you played in that first season in the Championship, kept the club up as well. Is that... <coughs> High in your list of achievements. Obviously, you know Blackpool weren't expected to, to do well in the championship. Probably one of the favourites to go down at the time in terms of your budgets, etc. Yeah, I think so. Um, when any th when any, any team get promoted, re the realistic aim the following season to make sure is that you stay up. People have, of bigger clubs might have bigger ambitions and expectancy level. Really, you, if you can survive the next season, gives you a platform to build on and. Um, and that's what it did for a number of years. The one thing that you look back on is, is the players that you sort of you you brought in and made them better players. You know what I mean? That you sort of you coached and you spotted a play and you thought that people didn't know about really. I remember signing Wes Hula and Wes nobody knew about Wes, and <coughs> somebody said to me, "Do you want to bring? I've got two players on uh, that you can have on trial from Livingston." So I thought, "Yeah, I'll have a look at them." So they both played in the practice matches and trained with us. And I thought, decent these two. You do a little bit more digging and research on them. And you're thinking, well, two of them together might be a little bit more difficult to, to work with in terms of two, one Irish, one Scottish lads. You're in Blackpool, which is known for its nights out. And I'm thinking, these two got a little bit of a reputation, but do I really need to have them together anyway? So I took that decision to, <coughs> to sign Wes. Um, from Livingston, and the other one that I sent back, I ended up working with a few years later, was Robert Snodgrass. Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, they weren't two bad players, <laughs> but I just felt together, they might, as a young young kid, they might just be a little bit sort of led astray, and uh, I, Snodgrass always reminds me about that, even to this day. <laughs> Probably had quite an influence on both their careers. Yeah, and well, look, and, and fantastic players, without mm. a shadow of a doubt, but it wasn't just people like... Quite similar players as well. Yeah, could manoeuvre a ball, could technically fantastic, could go... Wes more so at that particular time. The, the team at Blackpool at that time knew that Wes would play left wing and you'd look around on the pitch and he's at right back, getting the ball off the right back and all of a sudden he'd cross it, the team's out of shape because you haven't got a left winger because Wes had gone and done whatever he wanted to, but the likes of Klaus Jorgens and Keith Sutton would then run across and fill in for him because they knew that they would do that ugly side of the game because Wes would win the game by finding a pass score and an important goal. But there's lots of other players within that group that you thought were equally as important. People like Michael Jackson, who was my captain, was, was a leader. He was my, as we talked about earlier, my so when I was captain, I looked at him that he could do my job for me as a manager on the pitch, lead by example, run through a brick wall, nail one or two players when they weren't doing the jobs. And and people like Andy Morell was an experienced player. We had a real good group that would run through a brick wall for me and enjoyed being part of together and being in this um, part of this group that we're going to build and build. And all of a sudden you, you sign Ian Everett for 100,000 from, um, from QPR. And other lads that had come through playing Keith Southern, a lot of these lads went on then to play in the Premier League many years later for Blackpool. Is that one of the best things about being a manager when you when you unearth a talent and, and you work within a budget and, and you find like real you know stars and you know players that go on to be icons at football clubs? You mentioned like Ian Everett there, obviously went on to play for Blackpool in the Premier League and do very well. Yeah, I think I think I think you do get immensely proud of of finding a player in the first place and then utilising his strengths and, and improving them. And once you see a player that you've bought for a small amount of money or on a free transfer, playing regularly at the highest level, but then ultimately sometimes they're moving for a lot, lot more money, 
you like you think well one they deserve it because they're good lads and they've grasped an opportunity but two you've had you've played a big part in their careers and it was like another one um um casper got we had the latvian investment and i went out to latvia a few times to watch players and brought casper over on a free who ended up then going to play for reading and qpr and and the club Blackpool made money off him, and but as you mentioned there, he never hundred thousand and played over what, two, three hundred games probably for Blackpool, and it was. I think that's a big part when I look back on my career with a lot of the players that I've worked with, is the little gems that you you've unearthed, and they've grasped the opportunity to further their career. Probably most notably recently was I paid twenty thousand <coughs> pound, excuse me, when I was at Preston for Jordan Hugo few years later it goes for nine million to West Ham and and that, that makes you proud of what you've done and there's lots of others of players that are brought in for very little money and then they've left for three four million pound play um, uh, contracts and been and gone and played in the Premier League which is really satisfying from my perspective. Mm. Coming back to to Blackpool and, and the season you kept them up in, in the championship and um, <coughs> the season after you get the approach from Leeds United Initially, you weren't given permission to speak to them. Just tell us how that, how that situation panned out. Obviously, an attractive proposition, even with Leeds in, in the league below us. Look, and I, I think that, that season and even the back end of the season before, I'd had a couple of opportunities to go to other clubs um, <clears throat> and I didn't want to leave because I was enjoying my time at Blackpool. But once the opportunity or the potential opportunity to go to Leeds came about it was like something that I just did not want to slip by and Gary McAllister left and I, my agent got a call would I be interested and I didn't need that any time to think about it. even though Leeds were in League One Blackpool were in the championship halfway in the division it was it was my dream to, to go and manage that football club seen as I'd supported them played a couple of games but then to go back as a manager was always going to be something that I never thought would would actually happen, um, and so and then it got a little bit messy that Carl wouldn't accept <coughs> the the proposition from Leeds. I had to resign. Carl, um, Ken Bates sort of said, "Look, we'll deal with any of the um, problems that come through it all." And it wasn't until a few months later, after a few lawyers' letters and things like that, that it all got resolved with some sort of compensation claim. But it was it was a day that. I, signing and driving over to Leeds, I'll never forget. I remember thinking, how have I now just become the Leeds United manager after the greats of Dom Revy and Eddie Gray and um, Billy Bremner, Howard Wilkinson, and I thought, this, this, just, this is so surreal. Um, but it was, it was an opportunity that I was certainly not going to turn down because of my affinity with the football club. Did you take sort of like time sort of like take and obviously you've thrust into a, a difficult um, situation at Leeds when you first came in and we'll, we'll get on to that but did you take any time to yourself you mentioned there driving up to, to Leeds but w when you got there just to sort of take it in in terms of you know the, the facilities and, th and the stadium in, in comparison obviously no disrespect to Blackpool but it's, it's a very big football club is Leeds. Oh of course it was. the thing about it is as you know that I knew everything about the club I knew about the facilities I knew the fan base I knew exactly what they were doing I was looking at the results every week to see what was happening um, so I knew exactly what I was getting into, but I didn't probably have time to take stock of what the situation was. It was two games, two days before Christmas, so it was all about getting in, getting signed, take a training session, train, train Christmas Day, play Boxing Day. It was all like a whirlwind that, God, this is some... The, my feet aren't going to touch the ground until probably May time, June time, when the summer holidays are around and I can take stock of the situation. So. I remember doing all my press on, the, I think whatever night it was, Monday or Tuesday night with my suit on and being in Ellen Road, having all the pictures taken, thinking, this is this just isn't happening. <laughs> I ain't the Leeds United manager, but but it was it was to be the case. And then your first game in charge. <coughs> Couldn't get much tougher, could it? Leicester, top of the league at the time. And I, I was at the game myself and I, I remember the, the situation. Leeds had lost five games on the bounce going into that was it just about getting a result in that game to get yourself going yeah definitely and, and as a manager the first thing you want to do is to make sure that you don't lose your first game in charge um i don't it was nearly a full house um against leicester who were top of the division 
And I just remember sort of hearing marching on together, which is played before the teams come out and, and when the teams are walking out, that you're walking down the tunnel again in my tracksuit and it's like, where, what's happening to me? This, this isn't sort of what I may be supposed to be doing, but it, it was and I was just so desperate to make sure that we got off to a positive start, whether it was a draw or, um, or win the game. Uh, they went 1-0 up and then I think Snodgrass came on as sub and, and scored the equaliser and, and we, 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 we got a point. And then I think we probably went to Stockport or somewhere like that a few games later and, and managed to get my first win. So we knew we had to stop the rot, however it meant, however it was to be, and then try and get the season back on track to try and ultimately get into the playoffs and see where it could take us. How important is it though making that first impression <coughs> at a football club? And you know, get, getting you know, it was it was a point, but a very crucial point. How important was it? Like you touched on there, to, the five games in a row before that that, that Gary McAllister lost. How important was it to, to get that crowd on on side as well? Because obviously, Ellen Road's a very, it can be a very toxic atmosphere when the team aren't doing so well. Yeah, it was it was vital that we didn't lose the game. That we had to stop the rot very quickly, and still try and play in a manner of trying to entertain and, and give their all. And what, the one thing that I knew about the club was that supporters wanted to see players running through a brick wall, whether they made a bad pass, what they wanted to see was a reaction from that player to go and get the ball back, don't pull out of tackles. If you run yourself into the ground and you give an all and you lose a game, supporters will have a little bit of leeway with you. And, and that's what my key points were to the players. And I'm sure Gary had, had done exactly the same because he'd played for the club as well, so he knew what it meant as well. But I knew I had to try and influence that a little bit more on the players to say, right, you've got to earn the right to earn the respect from this group of supporters and by working tirelessly and doing this, that and the other, you've got an opportunity because as much as there might be a little bit of negativity around the place at this moment in time, you suddenly get a couple of results and this place can turn and this will be a place that the, the opposition will not want to come to in the future. And you obviously go into the job, ninth in the league, I think Leeds were at the time in League One, which Obviously, it's not where Leeds United fans expect the club to be. Was there an expectation from you from the outset that you had to get promotion in that first season or, or were you more realistic? I think the expectancy was to at least to try and get into the playoffs, whether we got promoted or not. Once you got into the playoffs, then who knows, who knows what can happen at any, any playoff situation that you're involved in. It was making sure that you did your utmost to get in to the playoffs and then see where it took you. The last thing you needed to do was to finish any any lower than you'd already were when you walked in the door. You had to make sure that you kept on improving and again, try and do whatever is required to get the supporters back on side. So we managed to get into the playoffs by some difficult times as well. I remember going to Hereford and we lost at Hereford and the crowd really turned on the group of players and I got a little bit of stick players were being told not fit to wear the shirt and, and remember me and Snods and Ian Miller we had a long discussion with the players and Hereford wasn't a great place at that time in terms of the dressing room had wires coming out maybe the players maybe thought that they were too good to be going to places like Hereford but what we did was we had a we had a chat with a group of players and a few home truths came out that they either want to be part of this going forward or you can leave the door tomorrow, get out the door, move to another club where you can have a maybe a more comfortable lifestyle and not play with any pressure as much. But if you want to be part of something that can be and probably will be successful in the future, then you've got to, be, you've got to do more <clears throat> physically, mentally, you've got to be stronger and we've got to go and show things. And I think after that, we went on a real good run that allowed us to get into the playoffs. Yeah, and a lot of talented <coughs> players in, in that team as well. Quite a lot of, probably say, raw talents as well. When you look at the likes of, you know, like you mentioned, Robert Snodgrass, um, and the likes of, you know, Fabian Delft Delft, coming yeah, through. Johnny, Roy, Johnny Housen. Johnny was, Housen. Um, <coughs> was was that part of the? And obviously, Leeds itself attracted to you in terms of the stature of the club. But was that part of the excitement of the opportunity as well that you, you had a talented group of players that you, you could mould into your own? I think I could have had 11 players that were probably the worst players in the club, in the, in the country. And they're still taking the job because it was Leeds United. Yes, of course, they had some talented players. Um, I'm saying, did it sort of, once you got there, did it excite you in, in terms of what you had 
available what you could work with. Oh, definitely. Like you only the one thing that you had was that when you were in the championship, you don't always look at sort of what the division below is like and what you're doing because you've got to concentrate on what you're doing at your particular club. But it, what, it isn't sometimes until you get to a club that you then work with the players, whether it's just a few days, that you can understand and realise that, wow, there's some good, talented players now. We've got to do as a staff whatever we can to get the best out of this group. I think one of the big... You talk about the talented players, but again, I made a key sign in, in, the, in, more, in January straight away that I signed Richard Naylor. Nails came in from Ipswich, was a Leeds lad through and through that was a warrior. He was my Michael Jackson at, um, at Blackpool. He was my, I made him captain more or less straight away. He would run through a brick wall. He would do this and he was your lieutenant on the pitch. And he knew what it meant to, to support Leeds and what an honour it was to, to play for them as well. And talk about the talented players, that, as I mentioned, but again, you need real true professionals with a hunger and a desire to get the best out of the group that you're working with as well. And, and obviously you went on to, to get into the playoffs, lost out to Millwall, but did that give you the hunger this season after? Did that, did that give the squad the hunger to, to maybe go one better? Well, I think when you look back on the two playoff final, semi-finals, we go to Millwall and we come away with a 1-0 defeat, which you thought, we've got, we got a chance here still in the second leg here. We're at home, full house. And we, um, we got an early goal and the place was electric. The atmosphere was unbelievable under the lights. And we had a real head of steam that we really felt that we were going to go and get the second goal and put the tie to bed and we'd get to the final. Then all of a sudden, one of their defenders had a head injury, allegedly or maybe not. But what it did was it took the wind out of our sails and it sort of just stopped the momentum that we had, the crowd sort of no fault of their own, that it, when somebody's down for three or four minutes, it just sort of, there was this lull and we just couldn't pick it back up again to go and get that second goal. And then before you know it, Jimmy Abdu never scored probably for Millwall that often, goes and scores and it was, it then made it more difficult for us because we were 2-1 down on, on aggregate and and we obviously we couldn't go through to the final. But what we did say in the dressing room afterwards, as you touched on, was we have got to use this now as a motivation for next year. We don't want to be suffering this disappointment of losing in a playoff semi-final, not being promoted and having the, the disappointment of, of suffering the consequences again. Let's use this as a motivation individually, collectively as a group to go to one step further and try and get promoted. And obviously the year after it starts so well. Um, one of the key decisions maybe in, in hindsight looking back now, the club sold Fabian Delph. How, how vital was that for you to get that transfer um, funds as well from, from, I think it was it sold to Aston Villa at the time. How, how vital was that for you going into that season, having that extra cash available to, to be able to spend? <laughs> well, there wasn't much. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was one of them things that it, it was always going to happen that Fab was going to leave because he was such a talented player and he goes to Aston Villa, Premier League and you got the money for him and look, there's a lot of, a large, large proportion of that money went to do whatever it was doing, whether to part of the ground, training ground or whatever or pay off debts etc. But it did allow me to go and get a few players in to utilise to make the, strong, the, the strong, squad stronger. I think sometimes people can see an individual leave and then not see the um, the squad benefit from it. But as a manager, you, if you agree to a decision to be made of a star player leaving, that is going to help the squad by bringing three or four extra players in, which can lead to hopefully successful times, then sometimes you've got to make them decisions. And I suppose it's probably not the case at a club like Leeds as much, <coughs> but for, for the low league clubs, developing those young players and then selling on for such a such a profit it's vital isn't it going forward into you know what are challenging financial times at, at this level yeah definitely I think a lot a lot of clubs in in the, in the football league have, have got a, a purpose sole purpose of developing young players to sell on in the future so their football club can be sustainable and survive when when difficult times come along so I think every club from probably championship downwards, and maybe one or two championship clubs as it is at this moment in time, have got a purpose of trying to be successful as a football club and, and get promotions, but really is about surviving, developing young players, 
and giving them the opportunity to, to have a career, but then if they're successful, then you, get, you can earn the rights of, of making millions or hundreds of thousands of pounds out of players that you've developed for nothing. And one of, obviously, I'm guessing one of the fonder seasons for you to talk about as a manager is the following season after where, where Leeds do win that promotion. Um, but another of the biggest memories of, of that year was obviously the trip to, to Old Trafford, which, again, I'm guessing is something you, you really enjoy talking about. What was the situation like going into that game? I spoke to Jermaine Beckford about it, actually, and he, he said that there was a belief in the squad that you would win that game, that he could win that game. Was was that the case for you? Did you think you could win that game? Yeah, look, I was the one that was saying that with it, to the squad, that we had to, we were going in that game. But not inside, do, did you think you could win it? Uh, look, I think you have the sense of uh, reality that Man United with the, with the present Premier League champions, we were a League One club, doing, quite, doing well in League One. What were the odds that we were going to win the game? Probably high, but... I had a genuine belief that we had a group of players that could perform on the big stage, get big results, and had a real desire to, to try and prove people wrong. I think one of the things that I said to the players leading into the week, or even the morning of the game, when we had a meeting, was that there was always, an, there was always, a, always a surprise in the FA Cup in each round. Why can't it be us going to Old Trafford, a League One club playing against the Premier League champions? Why can't it be us that are going to be, everybody's going to be talking about in the next few days, well, as it turns out, for the next few years, uh, many, many years. So we, had, we did have that genuine belief that maybe a lot of people with, uh, from the outside, and, and rightly so, didn't give us that, up, that, um, that um, credit that maybe we could go and do something. So we went there, a free hand, because as I said, nobody's expected to do that. But we, when you look back on the game and you analyse it and speak to people, we generally, um, generally earn the right and deserve to win that game. And when you obviously look back at it now, in, in terms of Leeds' modern history, it's one of the iconic moments, isn't it? How, how do you, as a fan, how do you sort of like process that in your mind that you were a manager, a Leeds United manager that won at Old Trafford against a manager of the likes of Sir Alex Ferguson? Well, it's, it's what people talk to you about all the time, you know what I mean? Sort of, um, they don't remember the defeat at Hereford or things like that. It is a day that will long live in the memories of everybody who was connected on, on that day or even who was at the ground or where they were. And that's how special it is to Leeds United fans that people come up to you and say, I was in a bar in Australia, I was this, that and the other because of, because of the size of the club, people were, were, were all over the world and, and people still sort of talk to you about it and and asked me how, we, how I felt on that particular day and it was it was a strange build up to the game because it, quite ironic a couple of weeks before I was, I was at an airport waiting for my son to come back from a school trip I bumped into Brian Flynn he was there and he played for Leeds in the 70s and he said you remember um, the last person to score the winning goal for Leeds United at, at Man United I went hey, it must be years ago I haven't got a clue Brian he said it was me and it was quite strange. He said, well, maybe it's going to be somebody might take that mant mantle off me and, and somebody else might be the one that's going to carry on um, with this new record as such. So it's quite strange to see, to see Brian. But people, a lot of people don't realise is that the draw was made after we'd earned a replay at Kettering. And we still had to overcome Kettering in, in the replay at Ellen Road, which everybody probably thought was going to be um, an easy tie for us. They took us to extra time, and it was all like talking about the Leeds against Manchester United. But don't forget the Kettering lads had this opportunity: one to beat Leeds United at, in the FA Cup, and then to the, the carrot was to go to Old Trafford and, and play against the Premier League champions. So they made it really difficult, and it wasn't until extra time that we ended up scoring two or three late goals to get that tie. So people forget about that. Uh, banana skin that we nearly didn't overcome um, but when you had the build up to the game um, and, and, and players will tell you more because they were out and about in the streets of, of Leeds in the build up to it I would drive to Thorpatch do my work and, and go back home but lads were in amongst the city supporters will be coming up to Jermaine and other lads saying look you've got to realise how much this means to us do not let them lot beat us you've got to give your all and you've got to make sure that you if Rooney's playing, you go and smash him, you go and do this and that. And so the players, if they weren't aware of what it meant to the supporters, 
before, a couple of days before the game, they certainly did because they'd had everybody and every Tom, Dick and Harry coming up to them and saying what it was all about. And for you as well, I mean, where, where's it ranking in terms of the list of your achievements? Because if you look at that game, uh, taking the emotion <coughs> and the, the connection out of it in terms of Leeds against Manchester United, in terms of your managerial career, it wasn't really a significant result in terms of, you know, you didn't earn a promotion, you just got through to, you know, it's not insignificant, but got through to the FA Cup fourth round, but how do you rank it um, as a manager in total, taking that emotion and, and the connection into account? It's got, to, it's got to be up there because you're the manager of a team that beat the, the present Premier League champions. You beat Sir Alex Ferguson in his own backyard, who was and has been the, the most influential manager in, in British football, if European world football, for many, many years against a group of players that were at their peak of their careers. And, and we're not talking that it was a fluke and we're not talking that there were a team that had the young kids playing it. They had a lot of their top stars playing because they knew the, the significance of the game. So to beat Sir Alex at any particular time, whether it was at Ellen Road or any other games, but it, to do it at Old Trafford is, is a highlight for any coach, any manager. You're not saying you've got one over him and suddenly you're a better manager than him because it's quite a long stretch of imagination, but it's a feather in your cap and, and what it meant to you as a young coach who you looked up to somebody who's influenced the game for, for so long. It was a, a massive feather in your cap. And how was it received <coughs> as well in terms of after the game when you spoke to Sir Alex Ferguson? <laughs> Did you get a chance to speak to him after the match and, and talk through it? Well, if it just go through the game to start with, that you'd, the goal that we scored, I'm right behind it, and you just, Jermaine had done what he'd done, taken a bad touch, he'll say he deliberately meant it, and, and then you can just see the ball that was going into the back of that, and you're thinking, I hope this has got enough pace on it, and it did, and the lad's celebrating. And then throughout, we, that was early on in the game, 15 minutes in or something like that, but even though you get into the latter stages of the game, the, you look at your watch, it's like 89 minutes, you're thinking, still got Fergie time, we could be playing 10 minutes of extra time here or playing till next goal wins. <laughs> and, it, and it was like, but we were comfortable. They didn't really threaten us too much. The team defended well. We at the bar, we had other opportunities. And, but you still always thought in the back of your mind, they've got a player that can do something out of nothing. But then you just looked across the, the referee and he blows his whistle and it's like, God, has this actually happened? And you turn to Sir Alex and he comes to you and says, look, well done, come and have a drink in the office. So we go back to the dress room, obviously, celebrating on the pitch with the 9,000 supporters that were at um, the Old Trafford at the time. Goes into the dress room, which was a fantastic place, as you can imagine. And I always remember walking back out the tunnel with Paul Jews, who's the head of the media lad, and he's, and he's walking down the tunnel really quickly to go up to the to do the radio interviews, which was in the, in the main stand there. Um, and we still had to do all the paper interviews underneath um, in the other media area and there's still the 9,000 Leeds fans in there and he's walking really fast I'm saying Jusy slow down <laughs> let's just sample because he was a lead supporter as well I said let's just take this in because believe me this ain't going to probably happen ever again that we're going to win at Old Trafford with 9,000 supporters in and it was just a surreal moment um, <clears throat> so you do all your interviews you go back in and because it was a big game, I had more staff there than I'd done all season. They all came out of the woodwork from suddenly Alan Sutton was part-time physio that was there. Never travelled on an away game, but all of a sudden decided that he wanted to be at Old Trafford. So they've all gone into Sir Alex's office, which was great experience for the lads. So I, I always remember Sir Alex sort of across the room says, do you want a glass of uh, white, uh, red or white wine? So I'd, in tongue-in-cheek sort of fashion, I said to him, look, I don't do anything that's got any red in it, so I'll have a glass of wine, white wine. And I could just see sort of Did his eyes, one? like, come across. <laughs> and I said, look, I'll, I'll have whatever you want. He was joking, but I thought, well, I'm a bit sarcastically, I'll just uh, say that thing. But I also remember um, him saying to me, look, you he, he was very humble and he did say that you deserve to win. He says, but you now know the pressure that you're under. So I said, what do you mean? He says, well, the pressure is that I've got X amount of money on you to get promoted this year. So that's your real pressure. So I said, well, you better let Ben lend me Berbatov and Rooney to try and get over the line then. <laughs> um, and obviously in them days you're allowed to bet on football, but uh, 
he, he was good and he's somebody even before then but afterwards you've got huge huge amount of respect for because as much as it hurt him on that particular day that he didn't like losing to any team he didn't like losing to Old Trafford and he certainly didn't like losing to Leeds United he was very gracious in defeat through gritty teeth because he was, cause he was very respectful in terms of his lineup that day as well. Yeah. He played quite a few, you know, against the League One team. No disrespect to Leeds at the time, but he played a lot of his first team players. You mentioned likes of Wayne Rooney, um, Gary Berbatov. Neville for Berbatov, Wes Brown played. Um, yeah, they, um, Kiggs, I think maybe came on as well. They did. They had a, they had a real strong team out. And <coughs> how did you use that for the for the rest of the season? Was it because you were doing? I think you were top of the league at the time when you played Manchester United, but it seemed like. It obviously went down to that that final day. <laughs> did did the euphoria of an occasion like that and, and the con continuation of that FA Cup run did it affect the momentum a little bit? The fact that there's obviously so much to celebrate. Well, it wasn't just that game. It was it was probably the next round of the FA Cup. We go to Tottenham <clears throat> and we draw t two two down there. Jermaine scores an, a late goal and we we get them in the replay um, back to Ellen Road and. Was it a distraction? Of course, you're going to take any time that you get the opportunity to play against the Premier League clubs um, in FA Cup ties and you do well because of the profile that it's lifting the club again and the individuals within the group. But it, it did play its part because I'm pretty sure of it that the next game after the Old Trafford game, we had to go to, to Exeter and play against Paul Tisdale team. And I saw his interview re recently where he felt that his, his attire was the reason why they won. <laughs> and look, it, everybody's got a reason for it and but I think as a manager when you listen to more experienced managers and they talk about when they've been away maybe on a European game and they find it hard um, to be motivated for the next game I think it took our players a couple of games to to get back to the the physical and uh, the mental side of it thinking that we are now back to the bread and butter of our games and the motivation level has to not just come from the actual game you're going to be playing but from within to go and get results and back on it again, and <clears throat> and that's why we suffered the defeat at Exeter. And I don't, probably two or three games before we really got back in amongst it again. And again in the Leeds United, where we we went through some ups and downs, got to Easter where we were sort of struggling, and we we got a couple of decent results. Well, no, Easter Monday I think we we go to Yeovil and we're on the telly, and we'd just been beat I think by Swindon on the Saturday who were one of our rivals and we got beat 3-0 and there was a lot of pressure building on on the team and myself and we go to Yeovil and Richard Naylor scores twice and for Nails to score twice in any game um, was a was a big part but it, it got us back on track going into the, the last couple of games of the season. And <coughs> the pressure of those games though, especially obviously the, the, the Bristol Rovers game, how much of a different emotion was there to that match compared to the match at Old Trafford I guess it's two two different worlds no pressure on the match at Old Trafford really, well it's like it when really was it's there. like when people say which is your highlight of that season it has to be the Bristol Rovers game because we'd worked so hard all season to try and have the one aim that we started pre-season and that was to get promotion winning Old Trafford fantastic day for everybody long lives long in the memory for everybody but it was just a, it was a one game. We had 40 odd games to try and achieve what we needed to do for, for the next season and the season after and moving the football club back to better times after suffering such a, a devastating period over the last few years. So there was a lot more riding on that game. I remember the week before we were down at Charlton and, and <clears throat> it was still in our hands then. If we'd won the game, we got promoted and we were losing late on and I remember playing with probably six players up front because if we lost it we made no difference we still would have to win the last game of the season and if we'd won at Charlton we could have secured it then but as, as people connected with Leeds United know that if you're going to do something you never do it the easy way and, and but we went into the game thinking if somebody had offered us at the start of the season that we're going to go into the last game of the season a full house at Ellen Road playing Bristol Rovers who had nothing to play for win that game and you're promoted I'm pretty sure everybody would have connect, everybody connected with Leeds United would have taken that we'd like to have done it a month before but if we had to do it that way then so be it and like, like you say crazy game though as well um, what was going through your head when well particularly when Max Gradle was, was sent <laughs> off for that uh, Max moment yeah it was 
it was just weird. We'd started the game. Jermaine had not been in the team for the last few weeks because he'd not been playing well enough and I thought maybe his mindset was elsewhere because he was going to leave on the, the club in the summer on a free transfer. Um, one or two players were injured, I left Johnny Housen out of the team, I think Snodgrass might have been out of the team and we went with the team, the, few, the games before that we wanted, that we thought might help us get promoted. There were a few decisions to make about who was going to play, who was going to captain the team. Because Norbo, who was another influential signing, was out of Dunny's Achilles early part of the season. And we were, we were pretty much down to the sort of, not the bare bones, but a lot of our group of main players were not playing to the best of the capabilities or, or were injured or unavailable. And we go into that game thinking, right, let's, let's do whatever we can to win the game. But then, as you said, Max just makes a decision that you're thinking, what? Of course, the pressure. And the pressure did tell on Max that he just made that irrational decision by stamping on Daniel Jones and left us with 10 men um, just before half time. And Did I was, you think the worst at that moment? Well I thought it wasn't going to be easy but I still genuinely believe that we would be able to um, <coughs> get something out of the game and it, it was quite strange and that at half time I ended up walking down the tunnel with Daniel Jones who was obviously lied on the floor when Max stamped on him and <laughs> Just some things just come into your head or it just happens without thinking about it that he, I turned to him and said don't forget second half where you're going to be playing he says what do you mean I says well you're playing left back you're going to be in the far northeast corner which is the furthest part from the tunnel and if we lose this game all the best getting off this pitch right and anyway so um, the game obviously happens and I'll finish this story before you talk about the goals and other stuff and with two minutes before the end of the whistle, and with the winning 2-1, who's playing right wing on, with two minutes to go instead of left back, Daniel Jones. He stood next to the, the dugouts, ready for the whistle to go to run down the tunnel. And whether my mind games or anything that I said to him played a part on that, but obviously there's a lot of other incidents happened before that we got to that stage. <laughs> well, that's a an interesting story. <coughs> I never thought of it like that way. Um, but again just you've got to focus on on the goals obviously and, and Jermaine in particular you made him captain as well um what was the thinking behind that in, in terms of make, making that decision and obviously the, one of his two most iconic goals in his career came that season did you always know he was a player that you know could give you those big moments he was a big he was a big game player he, he liked the publicity, he liked the adulation, he liked the pressure of dealing with the situation because <clears throat> I, f I felt that it, he thrived on that situation. You t talk many times about your man management and knowing your players and what brings the best out of them that he'd not had a good time and not been playing anywhere near like he could have done but I just felt that this was an opportunity. Nails was injured, Paddy was injured, Johnny Elson who was maybe one of the other ones that would maybe be captain was was injured or was on the bench and I just thought well, let's give it to Jermaine because we'd laughed and joked a few games before that that Snods would give Jermaine the armband and he would say at the last minute can Jermaine pass that to whoever, it, whoever ended up getting it and then Snods give it to him in the dressing room of the Bristol Rovers game and Jermaine's waiting for him to say pass that on to somebody and he went no you're captain today and I remember Jermaine saying yeah good one who am I going to pass it on to and Snod said, no, you kept them for the day. Come on, we're going to do the team sheet now. And you could just sense these sort of... It just became this person who, who thrived in that opportunity to be... It meant a lot to him. Yeah. And, and normally when things are kicking off on the pitch, Jermaine was probably a type of character that is amongst it, a bit petulant at times. But he was there separating the referee and, his, and Max with his own players and getting him off the pitch... Well, that would, if somebody had said before the game, Jermaine would do that, you'd be probably laughed and short, laughed about it and thought, not a chance. But he was, it just brought this personality out of him that, that I don't know, the extra pressure he, he wanted to thrive off. And the emotion, though, <coughs> from that game, that after it, the relief, the sense of, you know, what you'd have, you've achieved, you've got Leeds out of League One. Um, how do you, did you sort of process that in, in terms of because obviously I mean Old Trafford was a, a big occasion but the achievement of, of winning that game obviously meant so much to so many people well it did and the circumstances we people well 
many people will still remember that we went one nil down with 10 men we were with just after half time and it's like with 10 men oh god what we're going to do and i made a, a decision to go from a back form play three what was it three four two or something like that is that nine is that ten players and <coughs> and I remember taking Andy Hughes off saying, look, I've got to do this. And Hughes is the type of player that summed up Leeds at the time that he said, I understand it. I want, to be, I want to stay on and do whatever I can do to make this happen. But it's the best decision to make, Gaffer, because I'm not going to win you the game. <laughs> I thought, all right, well, at, least yeah. at least you realise why I'm taking you off. But we'd, it was a weird game that everything that could happen, happened. Johnny Housen comes on and scores a fantastic goal with his more or less his first touch. And it was as if we were playing with 15 players and they were down to nine men. The atmosphere was electric and, and their players could not handle the pressure. The goalkeeper, Anderson, was, had played really well, one of the best goalkeepers in the division. Decided unexpectedly to throw it out from one of our quick breaks that hit their lad on the back or something that fell to, to Bradley and then to Jermaine and we go 2-1 up and it's just like, Right, now we've just got to make sure that we don't do anything stupid that Leeds United can do and concede when we're on top. And, and the euphoria of sort of when that final whistle went, people running onto the pitch, all the staff, all the players, it was just a huge amount of relief more than anything that we'd achieved what we set out to do um, when it really could have gone pear shit. Because if we'd gone into the playoffs, hand on out did I think we could get promoted probably not because I just thought the psychological aspect of it would be a massive um, task for us to to pull off something like that after this after the disappointment yeah similar to sort of maybe what Leeds experienced last season yeah I suppose like yeah do you think I mean you are the last manager to guide Leeds to promotion do you think that's the thing in, in terms of the club that the level of expectation and the level of um, pressure that's on the players that can that get to them at, at the crucial ends of the season I think so I think I always remember even when I was there as a young player that people Howard Wilkinson would say that you have to have a special type of player to play for the big clubs you have to be able to more talented players have played at Leeds and and not handled it than certain other players that have gone and handled it because they weren't emotionally strong enough to deal with it and Howard always said that, that you have to have a d strong mentality to play for the top clubs but especially like a club like Leeds where the pressure is high and you either sink or swim and a lot of players have have sank and a lot of people have swim and come through it and made them better people for it and stronger characters for it but on the reverse of that you also know that the pressure is there that when things are going well they will really back you and stick with you because they're so passionate about what they're wanting to achieve as a football club and wanting from you as an individual to make their their day, their years, their months and their years. You went on the <coughs> season afterwards and fairly successful season for the club as well coming back into the championship, you finished just outside the, the playoffs places but was it a case of what could have maybe been that season obviously? Yeah didn't have the best of time in the, in the transfer market, did you, I think, in January? Well, it was, a, it was a difficult season and a good season because, as I touched on earlier, that you want to just make sure that you, you do enough to make sure you're in division. But at Leeds United, that wasn't the case. You have to make sure that you, you're mixing it with all the big clubs. And we, we beat QPR, who were top of the division round about Christmas, uh, to go second. And I remember Neil Warnock running down the tunnel, swearing his head off and this, that and the other. But... We'd gone second and we're going into a January window and, and we had a team there that were fantastic going forward. Your Snodgrasses, your Max Gradles, your Howes and Becky or Beck, uh, Beckford had left at the time. But we had, we had a real team, good team, entertaining team that would go and win 3-1, <coughs> 4-2s or whatever. But I, do, I felt that we needed another experienced centre-half that could just knit things together a little bit more. That We didn't want to take away the attacking side of our game, but we had to make sure that we didn't concede too many too many goals and I wanted to sign Gareth McCauley and even Casper Gorx who I felt were dominating centre backs that would only cost us a couple of hundred thousand pound and the powers above me decided that we didn't need them sort of players which in the long term for a couple of hundred thousand pound cost us probably promotion you can't say it's going to guarantee you being in the top two or the top six but I think with another more experienced centre half we'd have had a better opportunity to to get into the top two or at least sustain being in the top six and being in the playoffs. And, and the season after obviously was 
a similar case. Do you, do you look back at that time, um, those years in the championship, and, and like, well, sort of like what you mentioned there, but I think what could have been if you did have that extra time at the club, if you had those extra couple of seasons, do you, do you always not well, not regret it because it wasn't your decision, but do you, do you think what could have been? Because we had a real talented group of players, that of, a lot of that group have gone on to fulfil their their potential by playing in the Premier League and there was a lot of that group that didn't want to leave the football club because they wanted to fulfil their ambition of of playing in the Premier League with Leeds United because if Leeds United over the last few years and, and in the future had ever got into the Premier League it is still going to be classed as one of the biggest teams in the Premier League and I had opportunity to leave Leeds to go into the Premier League I had two opportunities to manage clubs in the Premier League but I always wanted to fulfil my ambition of managing the Premier League by doing it with the team that I supported, played for and, and was managing. Um, and with that group of players, it slowly got dismantled and it was sort of not given that opportunity to fulfil its true potential and, and people above you make a decision that things are taking you out of your hands to selling players to Casper Schmeichel who we bought in on a free transfer, only stayed with us a season because of they wanted to capitalise on, on getting a million pounds for him on when they'd only got him on a free transfer and people understood that it wasn't my decision why these people were leaving the football club and, and if they'd all stuck together and you put all these people, these players down on a piece of paper you'll go oh, wow what a signing, what a player, what a player, that team could have achieved something in the Premier League if it managed to get there and stuck together and unfortunately got dismantled and obviously I was relieved of my duties when we were only three points off the playoffs and, and really since then nobody has really, apart from Gary Monk and, and now Marcello, has got nowhere near getting into the top six which has been really sad to see that you're so close to achieving something which was taken away from you. There's been a lot of <coughs> speculation over the years as well, obviously it's been not recently, but in that period, it's been quite turbulent at Leeds at times. A lot of speculation that you could have like rejoined the club at times. Was there any truth behind that? Were you ever approached to, to rejoin the club? Yeah, when I was at Preston, um, Chilino rang me about going coming back to Leeds, and I've thought about it many, many more times. When I'd left Leeds, will I ever get the opportunity to go back to try and not finish off what I'd got going, but to 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 go back to the club that I loved and this opportunity came along and as much as I'd have walked back, I'd have walked on hands and knees to go back to Leeds, there was something that was telling me that the, it wasn't the right time to do. I was at Preston at the time and Chilino wanted me to go back and I just had this feeling, a gut feeling that this isn't the time to go back to work with this particular owner and I stayed at Preston and ended up on four and a half years there. I know that if I've gone back to Leeds in a few games later, I might have lost my job. And that's just how that club was at that particular time with that owner, that he would go through so many, so many managers, some obscure appointments to some good appointments. It was just a, a quite a, a weird time in terms of what the football club was going through. And there was no stability, there was no consistency. And I, I didn't want to leave a club where I knew I had that at Preston and, and the owners had given me an opportunity to go there in the first place mm. and I wanted it to be loyal to them. I yeah, didn't want to work for the, for the manager <laughs> until, as he was known. Um, after that came Huddersfield obviously, you got a chance there. Pretty sharp after you were lost your job at Leeds. What was the thinking behind that move so quickly as, as well? Did you just want to get back into the game as soon as possible? Yeah, I think it was two weeks later that I got the opportunity to, to go back to work and that's all I'd known as a player, straight of work, playing into management, to leaving Leeds, got this opportunity to go to Huddersfield, who were, who were in League One at the time, and I think it was fourth or fifth at the time. And it was a surprise that Dean decided to sack Lee Clark because they would, they'd have been on a fantastic run in the playoffs situation. Games at the time, yeah, and they'd had this run, I think, not lost in so many games, which was a record, but not won too many. Um, so when the opportunity came along, I felt, well, it's a good club, it's in a strong position. I might have an opportunity here, actually, because I think it was February time, to try and take the team up and, and get back to the Championship. Which and is what you did, of course. Um, yeah, it was a strange one, because we win the semi-final, go to the final, and 
and we won the playoff final on the 22nd penalty. You know, it's something you could not experience or could envisage was ever going to happen. Three, my f first three penalties, who were my most experienced players, missed all their penalties. And how Sheffield United didn't capitalise on us lose, on missing our penalties, that Alex Smith is scores his, go his penalty, Steve Simmonson comes up and hits this ball into the away end and Huddersfield have promoted them back into the championship. Quite, I'm guessing it was quite tiring watching watching that penalty shootout. Well, out I just it. sat on the. I remember sat with Dean Hall on the bench, thinking I didn't look at the penalties. I could just heard the reaction from the supporters of both ends who'd scored, who'd missed, and I just thought, what is what will be will be. And then Steve Simmonson misses, and I turned to Dean Hall. He'd gone. All of a sudden, I saw him. He was sprinting down the touchline to Alex Smithers and all the players, and it was like celebrating. And I thought. Wow, I don't want to go through that experience again. <laughs> uh, but b back in the championship, then after that, um, you, you again, you, you were in quite a safe position the, the following season. Went on a bad run towards the end of the season, lose your job. How difficult was that to take for you at the time? Because obviously, the expectation level at the club seemed to be quite high, considering you were probably going to be going to be safe that season. Well, the thing was, again, go back to it, the, the, the ambition of, the, of Huddersfield at the time when we got promoted was really just to, to stay in the championship the following season. But I think we got to sort of October, November time and we went into the top six. I remember beating Blackpool at Bloomfield Road, I think it was Monday night on telly, and we beat them to go into the top six. And this is like, and we were like, wow, we're, we're overachieving here with a group of players. Jermaine had come and, and signed for me and we had James Vaughan and two of them were scoring goals on a regular basis and we had a a good ethic of what we're doing but to be six in the championship we were certainly overachieving but then by doing that suddenly the, level the expectancy level goes through the roof for everybody so when you lose a few games and you end up sort of still above where you thought you sh you would be come the end of the season and people make decisions you find it a little bit hard because I just I didn't see that sacking coming sometimes you see them coming sometimes you don't that particular occasion I just I went into a meeting with Dean and his board thinking this is going to be about how we're going to stop the run of results. We've not lost 10 on the trot or something where it was really, um, really alarming. It was a results where we'd beat, been beat by Watford and I think Forestier and Vidra were on fire that particular game, 4-1 or something. But it was all about what we can do to stop this rot to, to really get back to where we were. And I walked out of the meeting sat and I was, I was gobsmacked because I just didn't see it coming. Mm, but then <coughs> again, it's a similar situation where you quickly got back into a, the game just a few weeks later at, at Preston, back in League One. How soon after you got the job at Preston do you know that this was going to work for you? You were going to be there for you know, a good few years? Well, I would have been there a week earlier if I'd not been in Dubai because Peter Risdale rang me and said, look, I want to meet you about coming to Preston. And I said, look, I'm, I'm in Dubai. Because it was only two weeks later again that, or something like that that I'd, I'd left Huddersfield and I was being offered a job. And I said, I'm not coming back from Dubai. I'll meet you next week when, when I come back from holiday. <laughs> so at least I could have two weeks out of away from work. And then, But I knew Peter because he was on the board at Leeds um, when I was a young pro there. I knew what he was like. He explained where the club was. And it was in a position where there was a lot of unrest towards the previous manager. They didn't really exactly see eye to eye. And I could just see from the club that it was a, a club full of tradition, history, um, and it was probably in a false position, I think it was fifth or sixth bottom from League One. And, and I had to run the risk of a little bit thinking, if I didn't turn this round, we might be in League Two here if I'm not careful. But I believed in my, in, in my coaching ability, maybe the group of players they had, that we could survive that particular season, stay up, <coughs> and then see where it took us for the following season after that. And you were given the chance to build as well um, at the club. How? How important was that for you that you got that um, season of stability as well that, that came after it before you got that promotion? Yeah, definitely. I think any time you're given time, it gives you an opportunity to, to, to rebuild a football club. Every, I think every window that you're involved in, can you improve it? Can you move the squad forward? Can you do the things behind the scenes to, to improve a football club from improving your staff to maybe the, the pitches, to the gym, to just... People don't always see, they just people, supporters only see sometimes the transformation of the group of players you're working with, that X has gone out the door and Y's come in it. But it's all these other things behind the scenes that you need to do to rebuild it all. And 
and, and we'll work really closely with Peter Ridsdale that his, his beliefs were the same as mine. We will try and take the football club forward in every window that we're involved in. And, and we progressed. My first full season, we got into the playoffs and lost to Rotherham. And again, team talk at the end of that was all about using it as a motivation as uh, to, to try and be successful the following season. And into that following season, obviously, the promotion came again. Um, another promotion from League One. What was the sense like going in, into that game? A different sort of feel to it, obviously, than the... Uh, Say, for example, the Bristol Rovers game and the, uh, the Huddersfield Sheffield United match. There was a sense of more, you were more comfortable going into that match. Yeah, you say that, but it was probably the one of the biggest and hardest times that I've had to deal with. That we went to Colchester last game of the season, knowing that if we won the game, we were promoted automatically, and and we lost the game. The players didn't turn up. The froze on the day, <coughs> and we lost the game. And I remember getting on the bus to the airport and the and the and the coach was just so quiet. It was like, as if that was the end of the season, we'd finished, they were all going on the holidays. So I thought I needed to do something about this. So I stopped the bus and I said, look, before we get on this plane, we, you have been given a second opportunity now to try and still get promoted. If we'd finished seventh, and lost, if we'd lost the last game of the season and gone to seventh, we haven't got a second opportunity to get promoted. We've gone from second to third. We have still got an opportunity to get promoted back into the championship. So let's not give up this opportunity. Yes, <clears throat> suffer the disappointment and the anguish of what's happened. I don't want to see you tomorrow, which was the Monday. Um, but when we go back to work Tuesday, we are prepared physically, mentally prepared for the game on, at Chesterfield on the Thursday night. And we have to have this strong desire to to prove people wrong because people were questioning had we got the bottle, the record of Preston when the playoffs was involved in nine and not got through any of them. We have got to go into these playoffs in a positive manner that we can go and get achieve our target that we set out to do in, in pre-season again. And Jermaine signed for the third time, scored a goal at Chesterfield to give us a 1-0 advantage. Go back to Deepdale in the second leg and I think we won. 3-0 and Jermaine, or something like that, Jermaine scores from the halfway line and, and we got to the playoff final. But it was all about the negativity still around the club that nine times, this is the tenth time of a playoff final that we would go there. How are we going to deal with that situation? And, and my answer was to everybody, records are there to be broken. Somewhere down the line, Preston North End will win a playoff final. And we're playing Swindon, who were under Mark Cooper, one of the most footballing teams in the division, they had possession of the ball, they had some good players and we knew we were in for a tough test but what we had is a week or so to do all our work on the pitch I made deep deal the same size as, as Wembley so we could work out, I knew exactly how Mark was going to play, we knew that they'd have the ball more than us and we'd need to do this so we worked and then my team early on and we did all the preparation and we knew that we could play a certain way, we would win the game. And when you look on stats and people talk about stats being a, a major part of football, Swindon had 65% of the possession, but we won 4-0. And that's all that matters. And we, we got over the anguish of, of, uh, of the playoff campaigns previously that happened. I know we've talked about Jermaine quite a lot, but <coughs> he's someone, well, again, when I spoke to him, he, he holds you very high in, in, in terms of his So career. he should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's someone who signed three times yeah. signed him, um, or played, he played for you for three times. How much of an influence has he had sort of like on, on your career as well, I suppose? Because he, he has given you those big moments himself. Oh, without a shadow of doubt. He's, he's, he's made me lose my hair like <laughs> I am now on many occasions to being an unbelievable talent, to the goal scoring exploits that he does, to, to scoring at Old Trafford, the Bristol Rovers games, to the playoff final, for Preston where he scored a hat-trick and he, he enjoys that and we, again it's down to the man management you couldn't give, beat Jermaine with a stick because he wouldn't he wouldn't take to that but give him an arm around him that you would you would get the best out of him but on the other side of as well all them good moments he, he has let himself down with me as well I remember 
He came on the pitch against... Uh, no, he, he ended up getting sent off with Owen Doyle at Sheffield Wednesday for Preston because they were fighting with each other. And I remember thinking, I've never experienced this as a manager before. You wrote two of your own players sent off in the one game for fighting with each other. And I remember getting a text off the both of them and an, an apology from them about why they'd done it and how what had happened. So we put it all to bed. Jermaine comes back, Boxing Day, for from his suspension playing Leeds United at Deepdale. So I said to him, look, go and influence the game. I know every time you play against Leeds, it's not easy. They want you to do the salute. They want you to wave to the crowd. Go and influence the game in a, positive, in a, a way that you can do. Five minutes into the game, Jermaine does something and he gets sent off. <laughs> and it's like, wow, we didn't see that coming. He'd just come on a sub and he gets sent off. And, and I'm like flipping out. How, what have you done? Why have you done this again? And so all of a sudden, sort of, he had these bad moments as well, but we had a relationship and even now we, we keep in touch a lot. He does a lot of things for my charities, at events that I do. And we hold each other in high regard because I know I've been good for him, but he's certainly been good for me. And like you said, a player for those, for those big moments as well, isn't he? But um, he, he also mentioned to me that he'd be interested in like working for you in the future as well. Is that something you'd ever consider having to as part of your staff? Well, he, he, came, he came to Blackpool earlier this year to watch training. He's doing some of his badges. Um, so I can never say never, his experience. Did, did I think when he was at Leeds he'd be, he'd be a manager? Oh, sorry, he wanted to be a coach because I didn't see him being a coach because of his, he, how he played was based on instinctive situations rather than coaching and developing people. But he, he's learnt over the years and spoke to people and played at highest level. So why shouldn't he be a coach? And um, even one of the charity events recently, he put up his services to, to an auction prize where he'd go and coach a team in the future for X amount of money. And so... Of course, he's a great lad, held high regard with a lot of people. So he might get a manager's job and I might have to go and work with him. Never mind me have a job and he comes and works for me. It might be the other way around, who knows? It might end up being, end up being you might end up being his assistant. Yeah, though. exactly. <laughs> then obviously it's Preston, a, you know, a few more seasons of consolidated success relatively in, in the championship and you make the decision to then move to Sunderland. Was it a similar feeling maybe of the opportunity that you had from the time at Blackpool going to Leeds, you, you saw the opportunity of Sunderland, which was one that you couldn't turn down. Yeah, I'd been at Preston for four and a half years and I said I'd had opportunities to leave there, but I was loyal to the club, liked working for the club, was building something, bought a lot of players in from small money and we were building this, this real good, close-knit team that could go and do really well. First year in the championship, finished 11th. Second season, 11th, I think it was, on, in a budget that was a bottom three. And we were building something. And I didn't want to leave Preston. But when the opportunity came to go to Sunderland, it was too big an attraction to go to because they were an ex-Premier League club. And, and I didn't want... I looked back and I thought about it long and hard. It wasn't a decision that I made just, oh, I'm definitely going to do this. I thought, I don't want to look back and think, somebody has taken Sunderland back to the Premier League and that could have been me and have any regrets so I made that decision to go there and um, when I made that decision I probably didn't realise that it was going to um, be a bigger job than I first expected. Mm. And, and how soon after you took the job? I know it's, it's probably insignificant in terms of you know, how you approach the job. How soon after did you know about that, the documentary, for example, and how, how much of an effect did, did that have on you as well in, in terms of how, I don't know, you, you approach things? Because obviously the cameras were there quite a lot of the time. I think in terms of um, how quickly did I understand that it was going to be a more difficult job than I thought, probably within a few days, because you could just sense the unrest amongst the group. There was players that certainly didn't want to be there didn't think they deserved to be played in the championship. So there was a lot of negativity around the place. Um, I, I generally thought as well that the group of players that we had there wasn't that great anyway, even though they were Premier League players. I thought, this isn't a good, this, this group here now that's just come from the Premiership isn't as good as the group that I've just left at Preston. It would run through a brick wall for you. The, the attitudes, the lads at Sunderland was, was really poor at times. Um, the documentary was already in place by the time I got there. <laughs> Did the documentary have much of an influence on, on how things were run? 
Not really, because as much as I wouldn't have agreed to it if I'd had the opportunity in the first place, and I know Chris Coleman didn't want to do it as well when he got there, it was already agreed, so he had to run with it. But the, we still had the influence of where the, where the cameras went. They weren't in the dressing room, they weren't on the training pitch doing certain things. So we, it wasn't as if they had a free reign to, to, to expose us in any light or whatever. And of course, there's certain situations you're thinking, well, that is completely different to how it was at, in reality to me celebrating a goal when we beat Norwich 3-1 and you're celebrating at the Stadium Light, where we're at Carrow Road, where there's green seats around you. It, it, and, and you know that these documentaries can infiltrate you as a good cop, bad cop at times, because it'll be boring if it's not. It, but it, I just thought it was a perception of, I was made out to be maybe sort of the one who sort of laid the foundations to the, the, the disappointment of relegation. But ultimately, Chris found it really difficult after there, and it was probably the whole environment and football club was always going to suffer the disappointment of, or, or it was more difficult for us to, to be successful up there than people actually realised. And the documentary perceived you as <coughs> this, that and the other, but they didn't put into context certain situations of team meetings and that when they were actually done. I think one of the meetings was, was done with a flip chart and everybody thought it was a team meeting. Well, it was done in pre-season, six hours before a game or whatever. It wasn't my big Winston Churchill motivational speech. It was a, an outline of what we wanted to do and what it meant. So it, it, there's a perception out there of what things are, and that's why these documentaries can be perceived in certain manners. Yeah, I think we've... Well, I put the question to, to fans before this podcast took place, like, has anyone got any questions for Simon Grayson? A lot of them mentioned the, the clipboard, <laughs> the whiteboard, actually. But one fan says, do you regret now, looking back, leaving Preston to, to go to Sunderland? I've had, a, I've had no regrets in my life what I do. I make decisions and whether they turn out to be positive or not, I would have had a, a bigger regret if I'd gone to Sunderland and the team had got promoted and I'd turned down the opportunity. Of course, you look back and get sacked so quickly and see how Preston have developed with a large proportion of the group that I'd put together, how the players have developed and gone forward. I knew that that group of players, players that I was leaving at Preston at that time had the capabilities of going on to, to get better and better because of the, um, the team ethic, the spirit that I've had, the quality that he had. But I just felt that at that particular time, Preston maybe wasn't going to have the, the bigger picture of trying to get promoted of 35, 40,000 supporters on a regular basis to the stadium, to the training facilities. And that's no disrespect to Preston. It was still building as a football club and... and that's why I look back and thinking I still don't regret going because it didn't work out I liked to do, how it liked to have done but that's just that's these things happen in life and um so, someone else has asked as well I'll just introduce this here now because I did ask the fans so I suppose no problem one of it. <laughs> it's always nice to put people in the picture clear of of instances of what's maybe happened and they exactly. don't see the what uh or people see what they want to see. Yeah, I mean, th this is an, an easier question. I don't necessarily think this is from a Sunderland fan, but he, he says, um, if you could have one managerial stick work out better, which, which job would you choose? I'm guessing it was between Leeds and Sunderland. Yeah, I w if I'm being honest, I like to have had the Leeds one turn out where I got promoted back to the Premier League and got the group of players that we've touched on to try and achieve my ambition of managing the Premier League with the team that you support. In terms of the next one would be probably Sunderland because... I'd made a big, big decision to leave a group of players which did everything for me and had a real bond with. So that was a difficult decision. So I'd like, I'd like the Sunderland one to, to have turned out better because of, from a personal point of view, but also for that club had suffered a lot of disappointment over a number of years and, and are still suffering that disappointment. Mm, but coming back to the, to the mm. documentary, not focusing on it specifically, but y one thing you did see in it was you did have difficulty recruiting players. How? How much was that down to maybe you know the the detriment of, of, of the club at the time coming down into the championship? The, the fact that you weren't able to sign players who you believe you know could have added to the group. I think the the, the problem that I had at Sunderland at the time that there was no money, and that is the that was the underlining problem. For you get, it. you yeah. got that impression from the documentary. Yeah, well, it was it was there in the summer of me going in in August. We we brought in something like fifty million pounds of transfers in from Barini going AC Milan to. 
uh, Pickford to Everton. I think he'd already gone at Jordan by the time I'd got there, but other, other players had gone as well. So suddenly bringing that revenue into the football club to then replacing it with 12, 13 new players for a million pound shouldn't be the case for a club like Sunderland, but it was. And that was the problem that you had. You're bringing in free transfers and, and players that were probably not good enough to play for Sunderland as well. But that's the, the market that you're shopping in. And that's hence why the club has struggled for the last few years because of the financial aspects of it all. And do you think, if, you know, do you think anyone could have turned it around? You, you could have turned it around yourself if you were given that time. At the particular time, I, I generally felt that I would still be able to achieve a mark of some success. But at that particular time, I got sat because the ambition of the club was to be in around the playoffs. Do I think I would have kept them in the championship? I genuinely believe I would have done and not taken them down. And that's no disrespect to Chris, but I do think that I would have been able to do that. But at that particular time in October, I think it was the ambition was to be in around the playoffs. So I get why I was sat because it was not the results were not right. But if the overall package of was just all about staying in the championship, then I certainly know I would have done that. I mean, that sacking obviously <coughs> well documented, well publicised. But you, in terms of your career, you, you don't seem to be someone who is afraid of taking risks. Um, and I think that's probably um, highlighted with the Bradford job, maybe. Um, how did you get into the process of getting that, that job? And... Um, how long before you got it did you know there were going to be problems there? Uh, well, I had, well, because it was interesting I how remember, you got it, wasn't it? Yeah, I always remember actually we took Sunderland to Bradford pre season game and speaking to Stuart McCall, and Stuart says, I've got this owner who's absolutely mad as atter and he wants to do this, he wants to do that. And <clears throat> you're listening, but you're not taking too much interest on it to a certain degree because it's, it's not my business. So we can all have arguments and dis disputes with owners, etc. So I took it on board but didn't think too much of it and then I lost my job and then I had three or four months out and I got this opportunity and I thought Bradford were in the top six of League One, it's close to home, should I take it or shouldn't I do, knowing what I'd spoke to, heard about from Stuart but also I'd heard from other people that were connected with the club as well but I had the opportunity of a three year contract there and I decided that I'd only take it to the end of the season with an option in my favour to extend the contract if I wanted to stay on. And then you get into the job and then you're thinking, well, this is probably, this is probably like people were saying and what I've heard. And you don't realise sometimes from, from the outside what football clubs are, are like until you get in amongst them, what goes on behind the scenes, what certain people like, what sort of influence people want on the running of a football club and, and what's wrong with a football club. My, my aspect, sorry, my perspective of a football club and my attitude as a coach manager has always been I will get an influence on my, from me onto the team and be successful because I've, for large parts I've always done that. So I thought at Bradford I would go in there, work my magic, stay in the top six, get into the playoffs and let's see what happens. Well, it isn't until you get into there that maybe some sort of naivety for myself of going into a football club, but I was doing it because I trust my ability of what I've done previously that would do the things that I've just suggested would happen. But then you don't realise, as I said, until you get in there, that the influences that were going on behind the scenes from the owner falling out with players over contracts to supporters being disgruntled because of this, because of that, and certain other things, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, this... <laughs> This has been some three months and then I just made a decision at the end of that season thinking I, I don't want to work in this environment because I can see something going drastically wrong and I don't want to be part of this. I'm not prepared to, to work as hard as I do to not be given the tools or the opportunity to be successful and a lot of people might have stayed on for the two odd years plus on your contract if, by extending it but I took the, a tough decision by saying that I don't want to be part of this. And unfortunately, for Bradford City's perspective, all them feelings that I thought could come true certainly did because for that following season, the owner went through two or three different managers and ultimately the club got relegated to League Two. Hmm. Dodged a bullet in a way. In a way, yeah. Um, and again, the easy option would have been to stay on, just to work, stay in work, have to pick up my money and do whatever I wanted. but. I didn't feel comfortable in doing that. Mm. 
But then, obviously, the, this year, the return to Blackpool uh, came about. It hasn't obviously gone to plan for you, but how much did you enjoy the experience and how much did you enjoy going back to the, to the club where it all began for you in terms of your management career? Well, first and foremost, I had a year out and that's the first time that I've had a full season. I remember being the first time in 32 years that I'd not started a pre-season the other, the other summer. And it was weird that everybody's going back and doing the signings and I'm like, God, this, this is what I'm used to doing. But eventually I got my head round it. I got myself busy doing a lot of this major work for, for all the outlets, doing covering league football, EFL, to Premier League, to FA Cup, to, to other games. Went off and experienced things that I've never had time to do from doing cycling stag do's to going off and watching other coaches coach. I went to PSG to watch them train, doing doing what you do in general life. I watched my son make his debut, which was one of the greatest feelings you can have as a parent that I'd have been working on that particular night when he made his debut for Blackburn Rovers. So <clears throat> I was there watching a, a, as a dad be the most nervous that I've ever been at any football club at any match that I've been involved in and that's the playoff games and finals that I've been involved because I couldn't influence anything that was doing. Every time we got it, I'm like, don't make a mistake <laughs> because it's, you're a dad and you're not having any influence and it was. It, I'm so glad that I was out of work to be able to sample that. He went to Grimsby on loan which allowed me to go and watch him play. So I kept really busy but then it got to the back end of the season and I'm doing all the playoff semi-finals with my major stuff and it was like, I went to Ireland with Mick McCarthy and meeting lads on the grass again and I'd not done that for a few months and I'm thinking this is what I've been used to doing, this is what I've done all my career playing and managing for 32 years. I'm now getting the edge back in, into my fire in my belly again and turned, I'd turned down half a dozen jobs in that year to go back to work but because they weren't the right ones for me I didn't think I was ready for it and I was enjoying what I was doing but then I thought that summer I'm ready to go back to work. I spoke to one or two other clubs about jobs, uh, one in the Championship, one up in Scotland, because I was ready to go back to work. And it was nice to be approached for, for good jobs. And then the Blackpool job came available and I met the owner and I felt that it was a good opportunity to, not to go back to the club, but it was more about what the future could entail with a football club everything he was saying was we're going to rebuild this club it's going to be built on stand for a year in, on sand for years and years we've got to make sure that we've we build it we've got no aspirations really have been promoted this year but we'd like to be in amongst it we'd like to then over the next two or three years keep building the club get the supporters back have a new training ground and as long as we're seeing the team getting better and the influence of yourself and and building and building that's all we're looking for and so some people talk like that and then we go two points off top in January in December and the expectancy level has gone through the roof and probably through my by doing that the expectancy level's too high and you end up losing your job off the back of it maybe you've ever got to learn a lesson that you should just keep your team sort of <laughs> in the keep low, low expectancy levels and then nobody can get too carried away themselves but that's just football and that's how football has changed over the number of years that people want success, they're hungry for success, but sometimes clubs aren't ready for success like people, maybe um, how they want it to be. And in terms <coughs> of, obviously we touched on it earlier in terms of your break now and you know, you're enjoying things now, but um, you know, what's next for Simon Grayson in terms of your career now? Is it a job? as a manager in the short term or are you looking more longer term in, in terms of having an, another extended break maybe? I, I honestly don't know what I'm going to do. The Blackpool one has, has been tough to take because from somebody saying that I was going to be given a long time to do this, that and the other it may, it, and you weren't and didn't ride a little bit of criticism from supporters or when you go through a tough time it makes you think is do I need to go through all this? of being a manager again and or being a coach and going through sort of criticism and, and the pressure that you have to deal with or do I want to go to my media or do I just want to go and do something else I, I don't know obviously the way football is at the moment in time there's far more bigger issues that are around at this moment in time for the whole country and the whole world at this moment in time so when football eventually gathers itself and gets back up 
maybe I might have a different idea of what I want to do. I've been in India for 10 days, <coughs> recently went to Mumbai, see a friend out there, took in a life experience of being in Mumbai, go and watch the, um, their equivalent their final, where I met Owen Cole was out there in his team. So managed to go to somewhere in the world that I've never been before. Maybe there's going to be other opportunities, somewhere like that, in terms of a life experience and not, not just football. There's, a, there's more to life outside of, than just football, but have I still got that hunger and desire in, in my belly? Only when football comes back to, to being available again will I probably know that. And finally, I just want to ask, <coughs> it might be a difficult question for you because um, you seem to have had a lot of ups and downs in, in your career, but out of your list of you know, your achievements, what would you look back and say is the greatest? The proudest one will be the promotion with Leeds because of what it meant personally as a supporter, what it meant to that city and what it meant to that football club and how we overcame a lot of adversity in, in that particular time. Um, in, in life you never go through everything smoothly all the time and, and certainly as a footballer, football manager, you, you come through periods where you've not been successful stronger. Weak people will not be able to deal with situations I feel myself, I'm, I'm a strong character from, <coughs> excuse me, from as a player suffering disappointments of losing finals, to being left out of teams, to being bombed out of squads. I come through and use them as a motivation to turn it into a positive than a negative. And in my mo managing career, I've had good times, bad times. It's how you come through them things. And if I, go, I want to look back on when, when I die or whatever, is that people look on me and say, well, it, he was a good guy, people who liked him, but he also he gave everything to, to what he did, whether it's managing, playing, cycling, whatever I do, I always want to do the best of my capabilities and have no regrets in what you do. So um, good times, bad times, just remain sort of humble and enjoy what you're doing because for what, 32 years now, 33 years, I've done something, that <coughs> playing, managing that, People can never take away from me. I've played 500 league games. I've had promotions as a player. I've had nearly 700 games as a manager, promotions, managed some of the biggest clubs in England. And what I will look back on is that if somebody offered me at 16 when I was leaving school, Simon, this is what you're going to do when you get to 50. This is what you've achieved. I'd have taken that as we are at this morning time. And who knows where the future is going to be. I look on in the future and think, hopefully my son will go on develop his career as a 21 year old soon at Blackburn that he'll go and have a good career but ultimately be a good person when he finishes his career and, and um, has the right attitudes and people will look on him and say right he was a good lad to work with. It's certainly been a fascinating <coughs> interview, fascinating insight. Simon Grayson thank you very much for your time today and uh, good luck in whatever is next for you. Cheers, thanks a lot.